All right, uh, thank you for coming everybody. We are Alert, which is an AI-based logging emergency response technology. And the inspiration for this project was to reduce the amount of harm to both the environment and humans that is caused by natural disasters. And we wanted to do this by decreasing the amount of time it takes for a disaster to be reported. Because as it stands today, a giant percent of natural disasters that are being reported are from a good Samaritan physically being in the right place at the right time and calling in local authorities. What we wanted to do was change it so, we wanted to make software so that you could run through a camera that would essentially be that good Samaritan, constantly watching and looking for any natural disasters or precessors to natural disasters that could happen. Um, and Paolo is going to rock you through the next of this. Right, <laughs> so the architecture of the system is super modular. The main part of it is the, is the command center and it has an like API endpoint with, which is SNS and SQS and, and AWS. And this is like a source of different like uh, events that are happening. So we already mentioned the cameras, but we can also attach like something that what we call the prediction engine, which uses historical data to predict certain events. And then in, in the command center, the main part of it is the rule engine. So it kind of like detects if like, because the image recognition system can give you some false positives. So we want to make sure that we only trigger an alert if actually something bad is happening. So the rule engine can say like if there are at least like two events from two cameras which are close to each other, then we trigger an alert and then we have this mass notification system and it, right now we implemented Twilio. So we can send an, a notification to like an individual user, but also uh, like in the future we can use a BTS so everyone who is within the range of the base station can receive a, not a notification like that so as I said very modular we can uh, hook up third-party systems as well and it'll like follow the same uh, like pattern here and now we're gonna demo uh, uh, how this works so the demo is so everything what you've seen on that diagram we actually implemented it's work nothing is fake that's important so what what you're seeing right now this is like a demo of the um the tower with the camera so so check this out so we are um, we having a, a forest picture. fire <laughs> what the hell happened check <laughs> well wait you have to it's important Come on, work, work, work. <laughs> I think we lost the Wi-Fi. Oh, there we go. Yeah, so we detect the fire. It's real, it really sent a notification to AWS and follow all these through lunch. Okay, show another thing, quickly. Now that there's uh, not a fire. Yeah, and that should work. <laughs> no, no fire. fire. And, <laughs> and also, because this is all about NASA, we detect aliens <laughs> as well. <laughs> oh, damn it, why it's doing this? It's important to frame it properly. Please work. This is very tricky, but believe me, it works. Yeah, we have an alien. And I just got a notification on my phone. Um, alien invasion started. Are you in safe place? Reply yes or, or no. Whatever. So yeah, and you c we can get feedback that everything is good. All right. So that's it. Then John. Yeah. Let's go back to the back. <laughs> we can answer the questions. Yeah, all right. So on top of our logging and reporting, we have a prediction engine. It uh, pulls in NASA and NOAA data to project and forecast uh, forest fires. Uh, combines with pre-existing forecasts where available. It's all it's an open API that's available to everyone. And we can alert subscribers to uh, high forecasts in their area if they are at risk. Um, <clears throat> next slide. Uh, next, there are a lot of great applications and extensions of technology. We can expand to other disaster types. For example, if there is a high rainfall in a l loose surface soil, we can predict landslides, or we could. You can scrape Twitter for disaster reports if everyone's tweeting about a forest fire or an earthquake. <laughs> but you can read the rest. And there's other cool <laughs> stuff we can do. Thank you. Questions? Wait. Oh, no. Yeah, I have a question. 
Hey, so this looks great, guys. Um, are you guys limited to just four fire, forest fires, or are there other natural disasters? Uh, I'm thinking specifically tornadoes, because those are very difficult to pick up a radar signature for a tornado. This, week, uh, this weekend, we built it for forest fires, but the architecture is extensible to other disaster types. The way the AI works, that we can easily implement if we show it some, literally just show it some pictures of tornadoes and then put those in high tornado prone areas, it would definitely be able to detect them first. Good. I have a question. Do you, for the picture gathering part, um, is there a way to integrate existing um, infrastructures to collect that visual data, or um, would this require kind of implementation of some cameras and, and things yes. like that in places? Definitely, uh, like systems like that already exist, but there are real people looking at screens, so we just want to make it in a better way. Yeah. Because so definitely can be integrated. We can even use like CCTV cameras or like people's private cameras somewhere yeah. and. and all this. Yeah, I, I see that on the uh, on the slides. You have leveraging IoT, linking private cameras, right? So you guys would tap into whatever's, whatever's publicly available. But there is a hardware component. If you guys, right, right, you guys would have your own hardware that would initially, at least in the first version, would be installed in these locations. Yeah, I mean, as I said, those cameras already exist. They yeah. are literally towers in the forest somewhere, yeah, and yeah, they yeah. monitor things, and the signal and everything is streamed somewhere to some center, and people look at the screens, right? Yeah. So it's just a matter of hooking up this algorithm into that stream and Okay. Dump. And how, how accessible are those streams? Oh, it's you fairly you looked into that? straightforward okay. thing. Next up, we're going to have the Smoky Bears. And after them, please get ready, tip of the iceberg. Yeah, come on. Are we There's no sound in the presentation? No sound. Can I just ask that whoever's talking to talk into the microphone? I will do that. All right. Are you going to give me a signal or just start when I start? Is there another mic that's on that's causing the feedback? Let's see. Okay. I heard a feedback loop for a minute there. All right. We are the Smoky Bears, and we are addressing uh, fire emergency evacuations. Uh, this is a very important subject for us because um, in addition to the people that suffer from um, asthma and other things, from smoke inhalation from fires, uh, thousands of people across the world lose their homes or have their homes damaged due to forest fires every year. And some of us, uh, like me, actually have members of our family who have died in forest fires. So it's important all over. Uh, we identified three personas that we wanted to help with our app. Uh, emergency managers who need to collect data from all over and be able to make decisions off of that data. Rescuers who are on the grounds and um, are the front lines actually responding to things. They need very specific information and no distractions. And victims who just need to get out of there and not be distracted. They also have the thing where we can't set up anything with a victim beforehand, so we need standardized tools to address them. We mocked up an app uh, to help a rescuer on the ground um, quickly and accurately identify where a fire is and where it's likely to change. Uh, this app will update dynamically based on pushes, pushed information from a server, and it also shows them um, where they are, where they're going, and how to get there. In the market, the existing tools are all very complicated and not easy for people on the ground to understand, so that's why we directed there. Uh, we're looking to use visualizations to help people communicate and also leverage smartphone technology because it's so pervasive nowadays. Uh, we're about to show you a demo that has um, an example of the information sources we're using, uh, NOAA satellite images and uh, weather data for the um, managers, and Google APIs for the rescuers, along with Twilio and uh, Clarify to help um, interact with the public. Here's a demo. Uh, part one is lo gathering location data from our users. When there's a fire, we send out a text message to everyone in the area asking, where are you? They use the standard uh, tools inside their operating system to share their location with us. This works for Android and iOS. It's very, very easy for them to do. We take this text message from them, again with Twilio, and we distill it to get the coordinates of where they are. We then send them a Google link, 
and uh, also just their coordinates to show we did it, and ask them to send us photos if they see anything dangerous so that we can crowdsource data. If they follow that Google link, they see a map with where they are, a location that we're sending them to where rescuers can meet them, and uh, how to get there. All right. If along the way they see something dangerous, they snap a photo, they go back to the text message app, they send us that photo, and you know, you're nervous, you might hit the wrong button. So we verify that data with Clarify. We uh, send it to our server, who sends it to Clarify, who does analysis on it, and if it's not a real fire, we tell them that it's not a real fire. Uh, and ask them to send another image, uh, which updates um, and will then be added to our database and cause us to reroute people if ne necessary. Um, we also have a mobile app for rescuers. Uh, so this is what the rescuer would look at. It shows where they are, where the fire is. They can zoom around, look at different locations. Um, and if they need to, they can click a button at the top that shows them more details about what's going on. Uh, a name of where they're going so that they can talk about it, other team members who are going there, and their estimated time of arrival. Finally, we address the future with an AR experience for rescuers. Imagine that they had Google Glass. You can see which directions fires are in, even if you can't actually see where the fire is, and also an overlay of where victims are located, so the, the number represents the direction and the value is how many people are there. Uh, finally, uh, we wanted to say that there are some constraints that we're trying to address with this, and it's extensible. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I love this concept. Um, one thing, I, I, I'm glad you addressed the augmented reality things. That, that was going to be my question. Um, but in terms of the victim or the, the rescuee user, I was thinking it would be cool to have them, like you can say, hey, you're in an area. We need information about that area. We don't have any. Can you point the camera in this direction and take a picture to collect data? That would be a very easy thing for us to add because we already have a text message loop going with them. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, working with people who actually have experience in this field, we'd be able to add more details to this. Fantastic. Uh, so typically, uh, emergency managers and, and uh, rescue personnel are in extremely limited bandwidth situations. Um, I see that you guys have some, some of the satellite data that's pulling out of Google Maps. How do you kind of uh, limit that or make it possible for them to work in those uh, bandwidth limitations. Uh, text messaging is about as light as you can get. Sending the images is kind of complicated, but I'm sure that we could also optimize. Like, uh, because this is an app that you send out, they can preload the maps, for example, and not need to access the network for that. We're just sending coordinates of how to get from A to B and a route as well. Awesome. All right, so uh, tip of the iceberg is coming up, and on deck is Unified Search. Unified Search. And sorry for the interruption, but just one quick thing. Please don't stand in front of the screen so we can see it when you're giving a presentation. Thank you. This is your HDMI cord. Do you have uh, sound? Oh, sound. Yeah. Okay, great. Let's plug that in, see if that works. Thanks. So our mobile app is called Legends of the North. It's an app for crowdsourcing data in the Inupiaq community, which is uh, northern Alaska. That's fine. Um, so things like uh, ice flows, um, thin ice, migration patterns, things that are information that's only privy to the locals there, uh, this app would help them, I guess, using crowdsource, crowdsourcing, uh, it would help people, I mean, researchers gain that information and it's, an, it's like a gaming app, so it also it has incentives for them to, I guess, upload pictures, videos, and things like that. The aim um, is to develop a game that will motivate young hunters to collect environmental, environmental data. So again, like pictures of ice flows and classify the data in the Inupiaq language together with their elders and whaling captains and share the, their findings with scientists. All right, so this is our app, 
and it's called Legends of the North. And you have an option to sign in if you've already created an account. And here you have a personalized dashboard where you can set your status, which is where you are. Technical difficulties. Not working. Why is it from the other? Okay, so Okay, so let's just skip these steps. And this is your personalized dashboard where you can set your status to let others know where you are to make sure that you're not lost and they have an idea of where you are in general and what you're doing. So let's say I'm a young person, which I am, and, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going hunting. So I can click where I'm going and I want to go, let's say, to Kiana, right? And I'm hunting caribou because it's my first time out hunting. And I can click different things to make sure that I get a personalized update of what to look out for. So let's say I were to submit that file. I have different notifications. So I wanted to go to this city to hunt caribou. But seeing that there are no caribou there and they're all down here, I must reroute. So I can start my trip, get a map that's ready to go, and I can take photos for NASA scientists to get a good idea of what's around, what's going on, and once that happens, I can go wherever I need to, take more photos, but someone has posted a warning that there's a blizzard around. So I'm going to dismiss that because that's close to the city that I did not want to go to. So I'm almost done and, <laughs> and I can go back to the dashboard. So, All right. so um, this app can be used by anyone in the Nubia community. So for instance, I'll play the role of a skinner. Say someone has um, a seal and um, they bring it to me to skin. and. Um, you know, I might skin it for a good price or whatever. But there's also um, a way for people to teach. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah, you can finish your sentence. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right, so there's um, a how-to feature. You can create videos to teach people, other people how to do stuff like skinning, seals, um, basically for the elders to help the youngers learn um, tips and tricks. What, what was the uh, inspiration for the project? Like, um, I don't know. We took the Arctic game challenge, so that was. <laughs> okay, <laughs> it's cool. I mean, it, it seems um, because it is directed towards this specific population. It seems like you know it would be, be very personal. Like you guys are are solving a known a known need oh. for within these communities. I um, I don't I don't know much about this particular community. What it, 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 I assume technology adoption is like is like pretty. Pretty wide, widespread. So this yeah. this would be something that they would get a lot of value out of. They're already are they using like apps currently to help with hunting patterns and that sort of thing. Well, yeah. um, it's we haven't done research on whether or not they're using apps to really find out where the animals are. Yeah. But the thing is, with this app, we can use that to help preserve their culture because a lot of these Native American cultures are dying off because they don't have as many like traditions passed down that start to get lost with integration to the more like, as you would know, the modern world. So um, taking pictures and making videos to teach people is going to really help them in preserving their culture. Yeah, there's, 
there's a nice archive component to this as well that, that I think is really cool. Um, I, I have two, two quick questions, or a question and then like a, a feature idea. Um, th th you mentioned it was a game. Is there like a point system or something that you get yeah. for? Um, here, one second. So for instance, you can see achievements. Um, there's a leaderboard, badges, and points. And that's like sort of the incentive for the young ones to use the app as well. Gotcha. Okay, so it's the gamification awarding thing. thing. Perfect. Um, so my feature suggestion is it would be really cool if you built in something that was uh, voice recognition because mm -hmm. you might be out like on the ice or something and you might say, oh, thin ice, and then you can just say record thin ice and then maybe get like a GPS position or something while they're there. But basically I can imagine while I'm out in the wilderness or I'm doing something, I'd rather just speak into the phone so I don't have to look for a button and select something and push something. So. That's cool, yeah. Just had a. Uh, what are your names? Actually? Oh, yeah. <laughs> My name is Zena. Zena. I'm Matthew. Matthew. I'm Susan. Susan. Is, this is so wonderful. Um, I actually worked with a team to help create this challenge. And what you talked about. It's not a question. Just letting you know. <laughs> uh, but, that, <laughs> but just what you said about preserving the culture. That was the essence of what they wanted for this challenge and, and what we strive to like articulate in, in the challenge language. So I'm really, really glad to hear that that's, that was what you took to heart when you developed it. And, it, and it's beautiful. So yeah, thank you. Thank Thanks. you. I own the audio. Thank you guys. While we're getting set up for the next presentation, I wanted to mention I forgot to announce the challenges that the projects were solving. So I'm just going to recap. The first two were, and you can help fi fight fires. Uh, tip of the iceberg, of course, was for Arctic Game. And uh, Unified Search is solving the data concierge challenge. And up on deck is Space Odyssey, Space Odyssey. So right now, Unified Search. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. My name is. <laughs> <laughs> Hello everyone, my name is Peter Lenz. I worked on the Data Concierge Project. This project takes a look at figuring out better ways to access NASA's data. Specifically, the problem that I decided to take a look at is that NASA has a whole bunch of different kinds of data. They have data that spatial data on landslides. We have other data about meteorites. Um, and they're all sitting in silos, and this makes sense. When NASA funds a project, they're handing it off to a research team, and that research team never talks to anybody else. Maybe they're in a completely different institution, someone in JPL, someone in a college, it doesn't matter. Everyone's operating in their own silo. But there is a thing that unifies things. And it is, in typical government fa fashion, excitedly named Project Open Data Metadata Schema Version 1.1. <laughs> Yay! It is kind of exciting. So every government agency that has open data publishes that data in a standard schema. And I can pull down that schema and I can take a look at it. And this actually took the vast majority of the time because I was looking for commonalities. In fact, I sat there and I started drawing out what does this data look like and how does it connect to each other and what things do they all have in common? And the answer is everything has a couple of little interesting things. Everything has some kind of metadata keyword, whether those are set by the researchers or something that could be extracted by a TFIDF or some other natural language processing algorithm. There's a temporality aspect to it. There's time. That can be when the data was collected, like when a satellite shot a photograph or when the data was released. And a lot of the data also has a, special, a spatiality. You think as a geologist, I could pronounce that word right, um, a spatiality component, and that's got all sorts of different um, complicated problems to it too. It comes in all sorts of things. The data concierge project also requested that there would be um, information about the viewers of the data, the people, and learning about that. So proof is in the pudding. Da -na 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 -na. So this is what I built, really quickly, two minutes. Um, 
this data is a prototype for a way of unifying three different uh, APIs at, at NASA. Apps has a lot more than those. So, for instance, I can say I am a teacher. I, in fact, am a science teacher. This has lots and lots of things. I'm interested in text data about meteoroids. There's date and location data, but I don't care about those right now. Um, there could be some kind of standardized API um, that, that pulls this. Let's run it. Run us. The scariest thing in tech, tech, tech is the live demo. We just ran this against one API and pulled text information about meteoroids. Um, maybe I'm interested in pulling te tabular data about that. So I type in meteoroids. And here are all sorts of different keywords that have been identified by NASA as things that are important. Um, I'm going to say meteor because it's not spelled right, whatever. And I run that against my query. And here is tabular data about it. I'm pulling from a completely different API. Um, maybe I'm interested in 10 Hudson Yards location data. Here I am pulling 10 Hudson whatever. I don't care because I don't have a lot of time. Satellite imagery, clearing this, blah, blah, blah. Searching, and this goes and it pings the NASA Landsat API. And that looks like an image. And in fact, it's, this is doing geolocation. So this is an example of taking things that NASA uses a lot of. They have all sorts of information in all sorts of different APIs, but they have commonalities. This is a project that can be taken into the future. This is something where we can make this real. This is doing really, 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 really bad stuff because I only learned Flask last night. Um, NASA has, the, has lots of APIs. There are like 38,000 files in their data set. And as I walk away, I will mention this is true for all government agencies that have open data. <laughs> You have no idea how true this is for all open data. This is a major government problem. You have to know what data you want to find to find the I, data you want. I am a geographer. I work with NASA data. While looking at this, I found data I had never seen before that I want to play with. OK, I've, I'm going to be quick with my questions so that the other judges can ask. Are you pulling geotiffs out of the Landsat data? Yes, that is running live. Whatever I put in would have come out. OK, um, are, you cap okay. Um, are you capable of scaling to pull out a cloud as government agencies look to push data distribution to the cloud? So all of that data was running on existing APIs. There was no server behind it. That, well, that's not true. There was one server behind it, but it was passing on to all those APIs. It was a polygot. Based off of the information that was coming in, it rendered a, it pulled a URL, sent it to the front end, that you, the page redirected to that URL. If, uh, let's just say, NASA, for instance, restructures their metadata requirements, are you capable of handling that dynamically, we would have or would to, you have to reprogram? We would have to reprogram um, as it stands now, but this is prototype code. This is not what you would run. This is, this is doo-doo. There's kids. <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> this would be rewritten. This is just a prototype. Okay. A real thing would be a lot more robust and not written by me. I'm a data guy. You want developers to actually write this. Yeah. Um, I'll, I could literally ask questions about this all day. Cause it's and I have a two-month-old, so I'm running with very little sleep. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll defer. I could ask about this all day, but this is awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, this is awesome. Peter, thank you for thank coming. You. <laughs> this is a great project. Um, there was a project last year uh, here, New York Space Tag. Did you uh, hear about that or see that anywhere? I'm afraid that anywhere. I wasn't here last year because I was... One, one thing that I'd love to oh, continue to see uh, you know, happen is see projects build on projects. New York Space Tag last year uh, found, uh, used TFIDF and some other algorithms to find like uh, terms and build a rich metadata for like 16,000 different government publications over the weekend. So you might want to use that data set. A absolutely. I mean, one of the things that I wanted to do was to use fast text to take a look at things. Mm -hmm. If they've already done it, already build done it. stand on the shoulders of giants. I, the best thing about tech is cultivated laziness. I want to not do things as much as possible. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are you sure you're not a developer? Cultivated laziness is the best thing about tech? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm definitely a data guy. You, you didn't see the code that's running this. There's, there's, there's single letter variables everywhere. And at least one thing called thingy one and thingy two. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, do we have uh, Space Odyssey? Is Space Odyssey in the room? How about Gas Genie? Is Gas Genie in the room? 
All right, come on up. You're next, Gas Genie. Sorry for the late notice. Gas Genie is solving the every cloud challenge. On deck, Green NYC. Is Green NYC here? Green NYC? All right. After Green NYC, Hack Pirateer? Anyone for Hack Pirateer? I'm going to keep going down the list until someone raises their hand. Code Clinic. Do we have someone from Code Clinic? So we are the last ones. So you're the last ones. Uh, Wildlife Go would be after them. Is Wildlife Go available? All right, please go on deck. Wildlife Go. This is, again, uh, uh, Gas Genie. Yes? Yes. yes. Gas Genie. Uh, yes. Do you have audio? Do you have mine? No. no. You, need, you do have uh, these. I should, I should these work. will work. These will work. Yep. Cool. All right. You know the format? Ready to go? <coughs> oh, yes. One second. Maybe with the presentation on, it would be better. Can you uh, stand over this way there? Yep. And then could any of you speak up to the mic? Yeah, okay. I'll need you to flip to the demo. Yeah. To the left, right? Yeah, yeah. Can you just hit play? I didn't give you a chance to do the free Sure. 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 Well, hold on. You, d you just hit play on music, right? Yeah. All right. All right. Okay. Okay. So, hello, everybody. Uh, we are Gas Genie, and what we do is we want to uh, allow humanity to discover, visualize, and countervail their own carbon impact on this world. So, uh, every year, as a species, we pump into the atmosphere more than 38 um, billion tons of CO2, which is the key reason, uh, the root cause for the uh, climate change issues that we are facing in these years, in this age. So, in order to countervail that, we came up with a plan, okay? So, basically, what we want to do, first of all, is to raise the awareness of humanity about this problem. And to do that, the concept is to take the users and allow them to understand which is the impact that they are having with their behavior, with the products that they are buying, and the food that they are consuming. In order to do this, we decided to develop an application that is capable to um, provide and feed the user with information about any product that the user can visualize on his own camera, and to donate to charities and NGOs that can act directly on, on a scale on this system and on this problem. So uh, our application uh, can do that basically through three main activities, three main features. First of all, identify. So the application can identify any product is uh, visualizing and to understand how it's done, how it's based, both pulling from an internal database and both using image recognition. And then it can pull up in augmented reality just for, um, pull up uh, information in augmented reality just to ensure a clean UX. So while you're watching the product and the same screen, you have to do nothing. You are provided with all the information about the CO2 uh, amount that this, production, this product uh, has faced during its production. And then you are empowered. So users can actually purchase and donate money uh, to charities that, that can work and, on these kind of issues. Uh, what about the technologies? We actually uh, focus all of our efforts on the augmented reality engine using Unity and Vuforia for all the part of the uh, image recognition, for all the part of the augmented reality. And in the near future, we're going to integrate Clarify for the a deeper image recognition. All right, so here's a demo of Gas Genie. Let's see, how much CO2 was emitted in the production of this soda can? All right, so we see this can as a QR code. This is how Unity recognizes that it's looking at a compatible object. So if we take a look at the can here, there we go. We see that 0.28 pounds of CO2 were emitted in this can's production. And we also have a button there, there is, um, where someone can donate a dollar to a charity. The charity we were thinking of donating to actually was, um, I forgot what it was called. I think it was a dollar a tree or something like that, where for every one dollar you donate, one tree will be planted somewhere in the world. So that's the program. If we can get back to Unity. I'll get back to Come on. OK, so in the future, we have three E's, to engage, to earn, and to expand. We can engage users by gamifying it. We're thinking of making a leaderboard for however many objects people have analyzed and or for how much money people have donated across their gameplay. Maybe a global tally of all the money donated to NGOs that support these green initiatives. 
we can earn. The revenue model can leverage a donation system built into the app. Perhaps people, because people will pay for things like a microtransaction. They'll pay for a dollar to get some coins in the game or whatever. And so we're thinking, why won't they do the same thing for um, supporting the environment? So maybe we can design, there are all sorts of ideas for revenue models. Um, to expand it, we could think, we could widen the database with the amount of amount of objects. We're thinking to deepen the food understanding and maybe, because we took inspiration from what was around us, we thought, why not look at furniture? We actually, in the research, we discovered that there are some, you know those polyester baskets? <laughs> <laughs> I was doing my thing here. You know it's not personal Yeah, and this is our team. Great folks, everybody. Thank you. What about the polyester basket? <laughs> yeah, questions about the polyester basket. I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, about three and a half pounds of CO2 were emitted in its production. Wow. Because we assumed to use PET plastic, that's about 2.3 pounds, and we took a ballpark, that's about a pound and a half, that basket. I have, a, I have a quick follow-up, oh, actually. Yeah. Um, so, two a two-parter question. Where did you get the information about the carbon emissions for for each of these? And various sources. Okay. And okay. And uh, <laughs> um, and is the dollar amount that you suggest for donation uh, kind of correlated to the emission, or is it? Uh, we were thinking. We could do that, yeah, maybe like scale it up, make people, we actually are joking, we call it the guilt factor. Right. No, I mean. <laughs> as pe as yeah, the CO2 emission yeah. increases, donate more and more. Sure. But no, we were thinking actually just unify it to about a dollar because people won't snap their fingers and say, oh yeah, I'll donate 50 bucks, boom, like that. Right. But if they see a dollar, they think like a microtransaction in a game, ping, I'll do it, sure, why not? Sure. Can I just add up about the, where we got the data about the, um, the CO2 emissions? Mm -hmm. There are online repository. They are pretty easy or even to scrape in order to get most of those data. Okay. So and like, is it a component based or a production line based? Like, do you have to look at each a different pathway, or d is there some repository of uh, final it's, product? It's it's both. So basically, you can like for the can, you can use like the amount of aluminium that is used to produce the can. You can um, get this data from there, or there are like the PC. So it, like, let's say a normal laptop, how much is it? And there is the full value of the of the whole right. thing. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, you've answered most of my questions. It's just one thought going forward. It'd be cool to see. Um, you know, there, there are large chunks of the world that have, did, a dollar is a lot of money to ask to donate. Um, so it'd be cool to, to show some kind of like offsetting activity they could do. Uh, maybe walk to work instead of drive or, or something that would help offset that carbon footprint as opposed to necessarily the donation. About that, we actually, um, we wanted to integrate it where what we would do is we would say planting a tree would offset the impact of however many aluminum cans or however many laptops or however many designer polyester baskets um, you scanned. Yeah. Uh, a couple of thoughts uh, I have. Uh, I love this, first of all. Augmented reality is great. I love seeing Thank projects you. like that. Um, first thing that hit me was I'm also interested in methane emissions because you know methane is actually a worse greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide is. And you, of course, if you're showing products in the supermarket or something, I'd like to know is the, the lamb or the beef or you know that kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, that's right. Okay, okay. Oh, actually, that's a tool. Uh, in reality, we can track anything. Any problem mm -hmm. that, is mm -hmm. that we have a database, we can even speak about uh, mercurium or any kind of inquinement agent can be added to this. And also the activities that are triggered, it's, this is just a mean, and anything once started can be used to, for an horizontal or a vertical expansion of the activities. Mm -hmm. So of course, any kind of, it's, it's a tool to better understand and to raise awareness and to understand mm -hmm. what's your impact in using the things. Yeah, and it's, that very much speaks, I think, to sustainability and extensibility. Um, so with that in mind, uh, a thing to really take advantage of with augmented reality is visualization, right? So it would be great if I could just at a glance, if I have two products that I'm comparing next to each other and like there's a cloud of smoke or something that represents the CO2 and one is bigger on the other can or smaller on the other one. Same thing with, with methane or whatever other emissions. You and I must be on some sort of same frequency here <laughs> because that was another idea we had. We were thinking of drawing up like small boxes. Like um, there's, that, there's this one XKCD where it's like, you know, it's um, the radiation chart. It's like the blue, the green, the red, the yellow boxes yep. to put everything into perspective. We were thinking of doing something like that with mm -hmm. if it was, for example, 0 0.28 pounds, we would have five little um, 0 0.05 pound boxes going to bing, 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 mm -hmm. up here there. And, and this goes beyond the scope of the challenge, but you could also do something with nutrition. 
uh, information. With what, I'm sorry? Nutrition information. Ah. Right, and kind of visualize that as well, help people make good choices. So thank you, this is great. Thank you guys. Next up is Wildlife Go. Wildlife Go, please con up. come on up. And on deck is geozoning. So geozoning, are you here? Come on over to the on deck area. Wildlife Go is solving the migratory travels and travel stories challenge. All right. Yeah, because I... Yeah. Uh, so, hello. We are Wildlife Go. Um, we're excited that you're here to... Uh, uh, watch us present. Um, we'll start off with a nice uh, short video. Um, once again, we're Wildlife Go. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, um, so my name is Jacqueline. I will start off with the presentation and then he will take over with the demo at the end. Um, we decided to take on the Migratory Travel and Travel Stories Challenge. Um, and our, our, our app basically, I guess in simple form, uh, is um, Pokemon Go for wildlife. Um, we wanted to make like going out in the wild or I guess just outside and like learning about nature, about animals, uh, fun and educational, as well as provide uh, scientists and researchers uh, data. Um, yeah, and it's a, it's a really cool challenge. It goes towards the sustainable uh, development goals. Um, there are lots of considerations that we had to take into account when working on this challenge. It'll be on a website somewhere. We won't go over that. Um, uh, we took on this challenge mostly because we come from, ooh, very diverse backgrounds. We have computer scientists, engineers, government um, uh, studies, and uh, people who do like CS. Um, but one thing we realized we all had in common is we all love Pokemon Go and we all love nature. Um, and we really wanted to help inform the public and help like scientists and researchers. Um, so yeah, who, do, who does this uh, app benefit? Students, researchers, um, scientists, res and um, scientists with the data, um, policy makers, um, and hopefully you. Um, yeah, mm, skip. Uh, so we, is there an opportunity? We really do believe that there's an opportunity to market for us. We believe there's a value add. Of course, there are uh, current solutions in the market. Um, usually if you go on the um, app store, you can find like wildlife guide apps, uh, animal tracker apps, uh, but they're a bit different from what we're doing. They lack uh, gamification. Um, the average user usually can't contribute data. Um, so it's not as interactive. Uh, um, usually these apps aren't, um, uh, they don't incorporate other data for like correlation analysis, they don't include climate data, they don't uh, include uh, um, topographic uh, data, they don't include uh, GPS stuff. Um, but yeah, we really believe that uh, our app uh, addresses the challenge, uh, especially with the crowdsourcing and input of data points um, and the work with uh, Clarify and combining with other data sets uh, to create these uh, cool uh, maps and like uh, visualizations. 
So our solutions, uh, we uh, have both a web app and a website. I mean, we have a phone app and a website. So here's the concept yeah. that I wanted to add. Yeah. So once you take a picture of your animal that you want, you just take the animal from the camera roll. And then from there. There, Clarify uses that to identify which animal it is and assigns a point value based on the animal and the location that you're in. And then we have a companion website for people who are interested in the, the data that we're taking. So this, so this website gives a general overview of what we wanted to do. So it uh, reiterates the point of taking a picture of animal, learning about it, and seeing their migration patterns. And we have a whole platform to help people who are interested in this data. So for example, in our analytics platform, we use an example of crowdsource duck. Crowdsource. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be happy to take any questions. Um, love the website. Uh, love the visualization. Are you is? How can you make the the raw data available in both an anonymous way, but in an effective way so that um, migratory, migration experts and scientists can actually dig into this data and, and find out what it really means. So we want to offer two, uh, two ways of the data for scientists. So we want to have that raw data and CSV files for them. And, but for people who don't want to see the raw data, they want to see it visually, we use, for this, for example, we use the Google Maps JavaScript API to showcase that so they can see that. Yeah, that's perfect. I think my, my personal opinion is both, and this comes from a, a deep-seated place of frustration, but um, the, the visualization is awesome, and that's really cool. Um, but if you, I, I'm, I like that you're going to provide the raw data behind it so that someone can come in and do their own analysis. Right. I, I really like that. The, you know, the data part and the displaying the data part are all really great. I'd love to explore a little bit more of how you want to implement the game and kind of what that experience is like. like one of the great things about Pokemon Go, right, is, that, is the experience of actually capturing. It, there's, there's, there's a challenge associated with it, and that's what makes it so addictive. Um, I'm wondering if you guys have thought about the game mechanics, because it looked like it was like snap a picture and then you captured it, which, Do you, have the you know, of the thing I a little simple. I actually have something I wanted to show you, if you don't mind. So Do it. Do you have the thing on Slack? Quick, be quick. <laughs> you, we'll use the gong again. <laughs> so these are just examples of like uh, wireframes from the app that we wanted. So for example, you would take the picture of the, uh, for example, a blue jay. It would give you the description, the location that you wanted to see. And what we also wanted to do that I briefly mentioned was that we wanted to have like a point system. So based on like if you see a rare animal in your location that's not supposed to be there, for example, like an anomaly, you would get more points for that. So, but for the researcher's side, if they see, like, a lot of people seeing a certain animal that's not supposed to be, like, for example, you see, like, an invasive species, for example, then they can use that data to track that. Yeah, fr from, like, a, from like a, a data perspective, tracking invasive species was the thing that I thought was really, really cool. Right. It's, and, you know, that's, that's a big deal. Um, okay, very cool. Thank you. And uh, I don't have a question, but I have uh, a shameless plug. <laughs> I would like all of you to apply for the next American Museum of Natural History hackathon if you love wildlife and, and making apps and stuff. So just go to the AMNH website and search for hackathon. Thank you. All right, up now is geozoning, and they're solving the Our Planet, Our Home challenge. And on deck is Will You Die? Is Will You Die here? All right, please make your way over to the side. All right, you guys ready to go? Thank you very much. Okay, so basically, I to.
Okay, my name is Rafael Vasquez, and here is my partner, Oli King. My expertise is basically on uh, urban planning and architecture, so I deal with a lot of buildings in New York City. And the idea of my app, I think I'm going to have to start the slides here. The, the idea of my app is actually to uh, integrate uh, geozoning data into the zoning regulations when somebody wants to build any building in the city. So uh, as we know, you know, the fertile soil is, is very important and is de degrading in the world tremendously. Uh, almost 30% of the land that we use for food supplies is being lost in the last years. And uh, there is not a methodology to, uh, uh, for sustainable land management around the world. Uh, as I said, it's about 30% of the land is being lost. This represents about $300 billion a year in, in loss. And also, uh, grassland uh, is lost, and uh, that affects uh, climate change tremendously. And pr primarily the reason wh why this happened is be because when somebody wants to build a building or a mega structure anywhere in the world, they don't take in consideration any of the ecological factors. They basically look on a, a you know, who is around or what, what transportation areas are around and depending on that, they allow people to build different ratios. So with, with my solution, what I'm trying to do is uh, I'm trying to take data from uh, uh, satellites, uh, uh, land satellites and water satellites and integrate that into the zoning regulations of, of w what they use uh, in the present. Uh, here is an example of how using a, a satellite data from a water and land satellites you can build a a chart and you can build a table of how is your land being utilized in a specific region or a specific area of the planet. Uh, also uh, here I, I'm showing that this is uh, possible now because uh, the number of satellites are increasing and it's getting cheaper. It, it used to be tremendously expensive to do that. Now it's, it's a little cheaper, more affordable. And also here, I'm showing how uh, by uh, providing a, a new framework, uh, city planning people, they don't necessarily only uh, take in consideration uh, what people are building, but also the ecological aspects of the area, you know, how water, how the forest, how the ag agriculture areas are affected. And then by, by using Python, and, uh, we build this uh, visualization tool to show how rapidly we degradating Earth. And this is what geosoning is. It's basically a tool for people to uh, have some inf better information about how to be more sustainable and to protect the forest and the agricultural land in the, on, on the planet. Um, I don't know if you did any research on me, but my wife has an architecture degree and worked for a major zoning uh, or a major planning firm for a while. So this is something that's like super passionate for me. Um, I, I love it. I, I think it's awesome. I think zoning is something that's often um, done in an antiquated manner and could use some pretty substantial update. It's also very burdensome for city planners. So anything to reduce that burden is great. Um, I would love to see, and I don't know if this is even a realistic expectation within the realm of this weekend, but I would love to see maybe in the future look at, um, you know, if there was some kind of sliding scale for the sustainability of the building versus the uh, environmental impact of building in that space. I think um, that would be a substantial reduction in the burden on the regulator. Um, I don't know if that's built in now or if that's maybe a future aspect, but I, just something to consider. Yes, absolutely. Uh, thank you so much. That was a great, great topic and a great, great presentation. Um, could you repeat your names again? Rafael. Rafael and Olifemi. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I was just curious, how, how would you think about conveying this information to the decision makers? Like, what would your, what would your ideas be in terms of, would you, would you want them to go to a website to access this data? Are you thinking about, you know, people come to you or would it be more, 
just a website where people can you know input a location and, and, and figure the information out on their own. Okay, well, until Friday, I didn't know how to do it. Actually, you were my inspiration. Huh? Me? Uh, yeah, Ooh. because you, you did a presentation where you show <laughs> how to use data to measure the temperature yeah. and the yeah. uh, you know, humidity and all these aspects. Right. So that's basically w what I'm trying to do. Maybe uh, th that would be the only way to do it in New York City. Oh. It's actually you will have to lobby the community boards sure. and city council and explain to them that they don't need to only take in consideration the environmental impact assessment, but also the ecological aspect of the area. Sure. Like, for example, now, now we're going to build like a huge uh, area on the east side, and they, you know, th the same thing, they always take in consideration how many people live in the area, uh, how many trains are in the area, but they don't take in consideration the, the ecological conditions of the, of the river or, or the parks around. So yeah. that's basically what I will. No, that's a great, yeah. great idea to use like maps and, and yes. tools like that to share the information. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that's sure. great. Mm -hmm. J just, just to clarify, so you, you do not envision this being like a, like a tool, a planning tool, like an interface that they, they would go into and they can, they can plan out where they want to, you know, certain projects are going to be, or a government agency can, can plan out access that, that they can, you know, they can auction off to, to builders and that sort of thing. Yeah, like okay. a, something to help with like a five, something to help uh, with like a five year, 10 year master plan for yeah. cities. Yeah, so yeah. I, yeah the, quest, the question is essentially like, you know, what, what do you envision the interaction being like and the product? As a matter of fact, it's a good question. I'm gonna be participating on a, a meeting with the American Planning Society next week. Okay. And uh, they actually interested on this tool. Cool. Um, so yeah, definitely. The problem is that in, in this country you have to scale from to, to from the bottom to yeah, yeah, yeah. up. You cannot go to, to the yeah. top. You know, you have to go from bottom to the top. And okay. that's what I'm planning to do. Cool. Uh, my just my question, real quick, is just uh, can you briefly describe the tech stack or any um, like what what your interactions with any of NASA data or anything like that? Uh, I'm sorry, Mike. Can you repeat the question? Um, just like what what you coded in, or what you what, what did you start kind of working in technically? Like, what's the tech stack? Uh, okay, uh, I'm gonna have to use Python because uh, it has very good statistical analysis libraries, and also the geospatial uh, aspects of the application. It will make it a little easy for me. Uh, I'm planning to uh, use Postgres as uh, as a mapping system. Is is uh, I already use QIS. It's called. So I'm, I'm planning to use that as well, and then uh, uh, maybe build my own uh, hosting s service, or put it on Heroku, but I'm more like interested in building my own hosting system. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next up, oh, right, Will You Die? Will You Die? Please come on over. <laughs> and on deck is Space Ghost. Is Space Ghost here? Is, come on is, up. Is the answer to this question longer than <laughs> yes? <laughs> Possibly. I like it. Uh, and Will You Die is solving the Pilots Plus Challenge. The Pilots Plus Challenge. Good luck. Hi, good afternoon everyone. Um, so basically what we're trying to do is we're actually addressing the problem of pilot's uh, plan but with a different twist, right? So what is exactly the best way to open up transparency with regards to overall flight safety? So can I have a show of hands here? How many of you two today still believe that when you board a flight, there's a chance that you might actually die? <laughs> yeah, so that was actually the inspiration behind the idea because all five of us actually felt the same way. So the five of us actually firmly believe that traveling should always, always be a hassle-free experience for every passenger. However, like I said earlier, and I think all of you agree, that anxiety continues to be associated with the concept of flying. And today, um, based on latest figures, there are actually 20.8 million people that are actually facing the same fear as all of us seated here today, in the US alone. And pilots too. 
So we found out that travel continues to be consistent over time, and here are some data sets that we've actually managed to pull out, which are the top five flights um, in the US alone. Since for the interest of the hackathon, we had a uh, limited time, so we focused on the US alone to assess the flight data. And we realized that there was an opportunity for us to change some ways in which flight data paths were being analyzed. So the current solutions out there is there's actually a real-time tracking provided by various service providers, many apps out there, many resources, but they're all highly fragmented. And at the same time, real-time tracking information happens to only be live during the flight itself. The second issue that we realized was that real-time tracking now only allows um, one to have an understanding of what an aircraft is flying over, but there's no overall risk assessment of that particular flight path. So what was the solution? So introducing Genie, an interactive dashboard that provides an overall risk and survival assessment across one selected flight before he or she departs. So current flight search methods um, basically only compare prices, departure arrival timings, duration, and the type of airlines. But what if we could go one level deeper? So in this demo itself, it's pretty much um, an overall risk assessment of each individual flight that we pull out. So basically, what happens if, say for example, you're on a flight from New York City right now to like San Francisco, what happens is based on a variety of factors that we analyze, we can clearly see how the path changes color depending on um, which part of the um, island it's going across. So if you can see early in the flight, there are actually a lot of green areas. That's where it's actually flying over water bodies. Um, the team actually came to a conclusion that water bodies, we did some research as well, that water bodies actually have uh, lower so-called risk assessment in a way because when a plane crashes, it gets submerged essentially. So you can see how like, it's live in a sense, where at every single point of time, it basically analyzes the terrain below the aeroplane and then gives an overall risk assessment. So the criteria that we actually used for this demo was actually pretty simple for the hackathon. So it's based on four factors, terrain analysis, population density, the ecosystem, and the overall urban value. So these are the essential technical specifications that we actually use in the demo. Uh, feel free to ask questions about that later. Uh, so key impacts, we really want to change the way we look at overall airline safety from the perspective of the airlines themselves, motivate them to actually um, so-called provide the safest route for all their consumers, and at the same time change the way we travel. We want to make sure that you guys down here in the audience don't ask that question whereby you keep asking yourself, will I die on this flight? We want to remove that thought from your head. So moving forward, we want to provide power to the people. We want to crowdsource some ideas that you guys have, some flights that you want to track, and collaborate with airlines, and yeah, continue to provide a data-focused approach, because this is what it's all about. Yep, that's all. Thank you. Uh, there was one thing I did not notice as a criteria you guys were looking at. It's like chances of being dragged off the airplane by staff. <laughs> I, I just think that that's something that should be included. That's sorry, place. United. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sorry. That was funny. Um, yeah, so I, I guess uh, I'd, in a future iteration, I'd love to see this take the next step. And I know we kind of talked about that when you guys were working on this. Um, this so the, the FAA very clearly defines flight paths that, that planes take. And that's based on minimizing the risk of collision, among other things. Um, I would love to see this as kind of a tool to help the FAA uh, reduce the risk of these flights and, and kind of in a collaborative effort, but also taking into account the fact that um, rerouting a flight might cost fuel and have a, a, a climate impact as well. So finding a way to balance the short-term benefit of landing in water versus the long-term benefit of dumping a whole bunch more methane and CO2 in the air. Um, but I love it. This is a great first step. And I, I, I really love that it's a public-facing site that puts that information out there because that puts market pressure on companies yeah. to adjust to, to what consumers want. So. Yeah, I, so you guys have on number two potential to collaborate with airlines. I'm just wondering like, what you think the airline's incentive would be to collaborate you know, when you're, you're creating very, you know, a very public display of you know, them and their routes being dangerous. That is um, that's it, that's it. Yeah. One of the reasons that you can, one of the ways in which you can collaborate with an airline um, would be for the marketing profile, like you said earlier, um, by making it public like that and also by making it known like that, they can reroute their routes, go over less populated areas, less dense areas, 
um, which was, would discourage things like terrorism, fear, and other things like that. Okay. Other things we can collaborate with, um, which I, we discussed earlier, um, is with potentially oil tankers, uh, oil lines, um, cargo ships, things like that. anything carrier reeling a, a dangerous cargo yeah. could be potentially redirected using this technology. And real quick, and then I'll pass it on, sorry. Um, you guys said that you ultimately settled on a set of like assumptions in order to determine what, what indicated like danger. Uh, could you guys just talk a little bit about what, what caused you guys to reach those, those assumptions? Um, and maybe where you think that those assumptions still need to be tested and validated? Um, so the three that we pretty much covered um, was population density, um, the ecology in the area, so forest versus desert, um, and then the value of the structures in that building, which is the urban value. Um, so a city versus a small farm. Um, and those three things pretty much go into how much damage would come down to the uh, beneath area of the crash site, and also potentially to the company that now has to pay for that to some degree. Um, and it, they're very, very wide-based vectors. So it pretty much covers all three areas of what you really could count and quantify. Uh, it's a really, really cool um, and interesting uh, concept that you've developed here. Uh, so in the challenge uh, design, you know, one of the, the ideas that we asked for was like some kind of educational component to teach people like what they're going over. And it's a really awesome take on it. Um, given your um, fascination or, or uh, interest in sort of morbidity, I think it'd be really cool <laughs> if you could. <laughs> yeah, like, you know, the, the, there's the, the changing patterns of, of risks associated with where you're flying over. It'd be great if you could kind of integrate, oh, if it's a water body, just to give a little bit more geographic information or a little bit more information about kind of why the risk goes up and down. That'd be really interesting for people who are kind of using the app as well. So that was just my comment, but it's really great. It's like on mass over throughout the route. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. yeah. And you could always add, you know, more data data sources and more vectors to your data yeah. set to give to them to calculate your risk ass assessment based off of. Yeah, yeah. I mean, any, any kind of like them, something that makes it a little more interactive, gets people to learn a little bit more about what they're going over would be, would be really cool. But yeah, but it's a great, really fun <laughs> application. Okay, so I have a million comments. I'm going to try to say them all really fast because I know we don't have a ton of time. Um, I love this. I think this is a real product. I think you could actually make a lot of money with this. Um, and, and my first piece of advice with that is look at Waze, uh, the app that was bought by Google. Um, and uh, that, that is absolutely a way to actually really make money with this. Don't partner with any airlines. Be the user and customer focused person uh, because, and let people do user input. If I'm on a plane and I'm experiencing turbulence, I'm going to push a button on your app and say, I'm experiencing turbulence, this sucks, right? So, you know, and, and same overall, like all around with the experience of flying. Um, the other thing I'm going to caution with is the, uh, the map, like the real time thing. Uh, in terms of reducing anxiety, if I were looking at that, I would have real time anxiety. <laughs> yeah. I'd be like, oh my God, I'm in the red. I'm in the red. Okay, I'm in the green. Okay, I'm in the green. Oh my God, I'm in the red. I'm in the red. You know, that, that's, you're, 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 you're recreating last year's election uh, <laughs> with that New York Times interactive thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I love it overall, all around. And the final thought I have, which bringing it back to NASA again, this could be used for mission planning on other planets. If I have a, if I have a drone or if I have something that's driving or flying over a, an area and you're doing geographic risk assessment, you know, if there's a feature that may be more risky or less risky, you're going to have to obviously recalculate for other atmospheres and other gravities and that kind of thing, but mission planning, this is a great tool for that. Thank you. Definitely. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Space Ghost, come on up. Plug yourself in while I do this. All right. On deck is Animal Watch. Is Animal Watch available? Animal Watch, you're on deck. Right now we have a Space Ghost, which is solving the Space Jockey Challenge. Yes? Yeah. All right. <laughs> Space Ghost. I don't know what the success thing is. Wait, did I disconnect from the internet? I'm so sorry. 
I feel like I might have. Yeah, we'll find out. Right. Yeah. Harmony, I have a problem. What's that problem? <laughs> I feel like my friend and I have been growing apart for a while, so I want to end the relationship, but I feel really awkward about it. What should I do? Well, clearly, you should use Space Ghost. <laughs> <laughs> Let's commence the demo. Yes. Uh, do you want to read that? And I'll read the other one. Did you hear about Pluto? That's messed up, right? <laughs> Funny story, actually. I'm going to space. Wait, are you space ghosting me? What? That's ridiculous. I've decided to become an astronaut. My first mission, Pluto. <laughs> so, as you can see in our app, there is some delay between some delay between when we send the texts and when they're actually received. And the reason for this is because we are thinking, what if you could actually text people from space? Theoretically, the farther apart you get, the longer it takes for the messages to transmit to each other. And so we thought that that could be a fun idea. And you know, theoretically, if you're going apart from somebody affection-wise, this is like a nice metaphor for that. But. <laughs> Realistic applications would include, like, if you're going on a mock space mission, then you could use this if you had, like, a mock space phone to try and see what that communication delay might feel like in real life. Um, and another application is if you and your SO are thinking of having a long distance relationship and you're worried that your relationship maybe wouldn't survive the distance, like, really long distance, <laughs> then you could use our app to test it out. And please stay tuned for our next app, Space Ghostbusters, to find out if somebody is using Space Ghost on you. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, I would love to see a feature that actually, uh, for the educational aspect of it, like says, you're receiving this message this time because, or like it was originally sent at this time and you're receiving it at this time, just to like prop up that whole, you know, it takes this long for a message to propagate aspect of it. Similar to getting a message from like Saturn or from... Yeah, actually I was just thinking about that, like that could be a way in which you select the severity of the space ghosting, right? It's like, do you, s you want this to be like Pluto status, right? It's going to take a real long time, right? <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah, or Alpha Centauri. I don't know. I mean, whatever, whatever, you, whatever way out there. Yeah, whatever you've gone on with your SO. I don't know. Um, so, I, another, just to tack onto the feature edition, um, I have sent many a text message um, that I have wished I hadn't sent pretty much immediately. Um, so, with the delay built in, it'd be nice if I could go back and say, "Oh, I wish I hadn't said that," and I could delete it before it was sent. Just a, a thought there. And you know. You're Pluto away, so you know how much time it's going to take. Yeah, I know, I, know, I know that if I'm coming from Mars, like, I better make up my mind real quick. You could even assign people planetary statuses or stati, and then that way, you know, like, oh, in-laws, they got to be Pluto status so I can take stuff back. Yeah. Someone else. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, next up is Animal Watch. Animal Watch, make your way to the front. Uh, we're going to have uh, Green NYC next. Green NYC is on deck. Animal Watch is solving the Trace Invaders Challenge.
You guys ready? Good luck. Hi, uh, my name is Alex. This is Vanis, Mikhail, and Renault, and we're going to present Animal Watch. Uh, our, challenge, our challenge is trace invaders. We're developing a tool to track invasive species, or in our case, all animals, over time. And one of the sustained development goals is to strengthen efforts to protect and safeguard the world's natural heritage. So to support this, we built the Animal Watch app. Uh, you can join Animal Watch and report animal sightings. You can see sightings from other Animal Watch members near you. You can click on the sighting. It'll show you what animal was there, what time it was reported, and some more information about the animal. Um, when a new sighting is reported, it'll text you to let you know there's something in the area you may be interested in. Uh, we built it as a web app, optimized for mobile use. We have Twilio for notifications and Heroku and Amazon hosting. Um, for user engagement, we decided we're going to target children and families, getting these kids interested in animals and the environment around them and allowing them to form a connection with their environment. We'll then aggregate the sighting data on the back end to pass on to experts studying animal populations, invasive species, um, and just anything about the animals in general. And I'm going to hand it over to Mikhail to demo now. Greetings, citizens. I invite you to join the Animal Watch. Your mission is to observe the wildlife in the Yellowstone National Park. But this task is too big to do it alone. That's why your fellow watchmen already helped you by spotting the animals in your area. If the tracks are fresh, the pin will be jumping. You can find more information about the animals by clicking on the pin and scrolling down. Now it's your time to return the favor. To, so just go out there and explore. If you see an animal, click on the new sighting button, then adjust the location of the animal that you see, then check which animal you spotted, select the animal, and by the way, if the animal is dangerous, don't come too close to it. <laughs> we know you're brave watchmen, but nevertheless, then take a picture. You guys are not bison, but close enough. <laughs> and submit. Aha. So now your fellow watchman in the area will get a text message to see that uh, the animal has been added. But don't think for a second that this is just for your entertainment. We will be collecting the data and uh, sharing it with the researchers across the globe to see their migratory patterns uh, for their animals. And then they will analyze it and study it in the future. Uh, so let's see that the new spot was added. Uh, we were adding the bison, and he's right there, 1543. Uh, the app is live, and uh, you guys can go to animalwatchherokoapp.com to check it out. Um, so. Are you ready to join the Animal Watch? <laughs> Thank you. We're stunned. We're so good. <laughs> so you're ready. <laughs> yeah. um, that was great. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the, the team and what role you played on the project? Oh, sure. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> the, the web service is built in Go. Uh, the database we use is Postgres, so I built most of that. And the web app itself is kind of like divided among all of us. It's built in React, and I can let the rest speak for them. So I'm basically in charge of the capturing of the animal because I did the camera capturing part. I did uh, some of the front end work and uh, the goofy uh, pictures and whatnot. And the great presentation. <laughs> I designed the database and helped Mikhail with the front end. 
So I'm like the world's worst boy scout in that I would see a bison and think it was like a cow, right? And that's an extreme example, but point being, I think it'd be cool if you guys were able to uh, implement um, AR, maybe using some of the available tools that were here and kind of uh, intelligently recognize, you know, instead of asking the user to know what they're looking at, uh, let the database know what they're looking at. Yeah, we, we were thinking of using Clarify to kind of like identify a picture, uh, an animal in the picture and kind of let the user guess whether, hey, is this a bison? Or guess, get, make a guess and we'll tell you if it's correct or not. But the thing was, when we were looking at the general uh, mo learning model in Clarify, it was returning like no person, grass, you know, a little bit of too much noise in the data set. So we needed to create a custom learning model just on animals and we should be able to have much better probability that way but we just didn't get there. Yeah, fair enough. Um, yeah, and then I guess so my thought on that is it'd be, it would kind of help with the gamification of it is say you get uh, 10 bonus points if you correctly identified the animal that you were looking at, but it's, it's a, a cool next step. Yeah. And I think if um, the, only, the only one thought I had is that smartphone cameras aren't that great, so you might want to give people an option to upload from a, like a, if they have a zoom lens a camera or something like that, because if they're out there and they have like a really good camera, the, you know, the bison might be far away, but they can take a better picture with a real camera than a smartphone camera. Yeah, the desktop version of this app actually has the upload version, and the, uh, the mobile version of this app actually had the selection of uh, either use camera or file system to upload the picture. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Up next is going to be uh, Green NYC. Green NYC solving the Live Smart Challenge. Come on up. And on deck, on deck is going to be flood hydraulic power. Is flood hydraulic power here? Here you go. Uh, which one do you need? You need this one. Oh, thank you. Here, you take that. I will take this. Flood hydraulic power. Okay, we'll move on to terror beasts, aka penguin armadillos. All right, come on up. You'll be on deck. And I'm going to turn it over to Green NYC. Great, thank you. Thanks. All right, so since this year's um, theme is Earth, we decided to look into our own home, which is New York City. And this is the question that we had in mind like, how does climate change affect low income neighborhoods in New York City? And through the data, we can see that annual temperature in New York City is rising, but how are different neighborhoods in New York City affected by the rising temperatures? Um, so when we look at um, the data from Landsat, we can see there are these pockets of heat um, in these neighborhoods, and these are called the urban heat island effect. And I'll take... Yeah. So what is the urban heat island effect exactly? So the it's found in environments with uh, a lot of concrete, uh, asphalts, roads, pavements, and so on and so forth. The environment absorbs the heat from the sun and re emits that energy as heat. And so there's not enough vegetation to alleviate that problem, which results in higher temperature averages, especially in the summer months. So why are the hottest neighborhoods in New York City? We found out that the Bronx and the uh, Bronx in Brooklyn has the highest surface temperatures. So how does that correlate to income level? So we can see that certain pockets of neighborhoods in Bronx and Brooklyn have some of the lowest uh, medium household income levels in New York City. So how does the urban heat island effect specifically impact low income neighborhoods? Uh, in general, excessive exposure to high heat can cause increased rates of uh, heat stroke and just heat associated mortalities in general. So, low income people are especially vulnerable because of their lack of public access to air conditioners, more urban development due to gentrification, and poor housing quality in general. So what can we do exactly? So we suggest adding more green spaces to low income neighborhoods. A study in Chicago showed that vegetated areas provide relief from heat, the, the heat island effect caused by the heat trapping qualities of asphalt, concrete, and so on. 
So how would addressing the ecological impact of this phenomenon uh, improve the quality of life in low-income neighborhoods? So we suggested urban farming in, in particular. There are already organizations out there uh, leading this effort to educate people on urban farming, and better nutrition, and even managing a farmer's market such as Green Gorilla. So why urban farming in particular? We found out that in low-income neighborhoods, they are plagued by food inaccessibility. And according to uh, NYC.gov's uh, 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 definition, it's a lack of access to good nutritional foods for all members of that household. And this is the data that we found in uh, food insecurity in New York City. As you can see from our previous correlations that we've tabulated, uh, Brooklyn and the Bronx have the highest amounts of food insecurity in the city. So let's talk about the positive uh, impacts of urban farming. It increases food security, increases job creation and economic empowerment, decreases health risks, and minimizing the need for transportation from other farms. So what in particular? So throughout this uh, hackathon, uh, we were trying to come up with uh, different solutions to solve this problem in particular. However, we found out that it's so much, like, uh, it's so much big of a problem to solve beyond the, beyond the time of a hackathon. So we provide these solutions here. So uh, we, we, came, we came up with these three ideas here providing more data that shows positive benefits for urban farming. Uh, working. Uh, working with established organizations to expand their programs to other urbanized areas in New York City and, belong, and beyond, and creating an online platform that helps connect these organizations to share their proven methods of success and encourage people to mobilize in their own communities globally. So. Um, just to end, uh, we didn't come up That's with any. <laughs> yeah, we didn't come up with any <laughs> solutions. Uh, uh, but I think all the things that we've learned in the past 36 hours during this hackathon, um, I think these are important questions that we can ask ourselves when we are planning the next uh, generation um, sustainable cities. So. Woo! Yeah, food insecurity affects uh, one of five households in America. So this is a huge issue. Um, and it's, it's pretty easy to overlook um, because, you know, food insecurity is like kind of a vague term. Or like, what was that really? It's hard to, it's a, it's a very specifically defined term. So I, I like that you guys identified that. Um, and urban farming has a lot of benefits even beyond food security. Um, I, if you guys are going to take this kind of research a next step further, I'd love to see you explore uh, sea level change and see how that's going to impact uh, some of those areas as well. Um, I, I would say that uh, some of the wealthiest parts of New York are probably going to become some of the uh, greatest parts of Atlantis in the future. <laughs> so, um, how do, but how does that impact uh, the the uh, the planning and the the future of New York City? It, I think those, it's a cool next step for you guys to take if you're going to continue this research. Um, I, I think what you have here is a great like concept, you know, and, and I don't I think that getting there in 36 hours it's itself remarkable because the topic that you've considered is something that's being discussed, you know, I know we do it extensively at NASA, I work with Noah a lot on the urban heat island effect and I had a chance to talk to you on yeah. Friday and I, I mean, uh, you know, just to see that you got from urban heat island effect looking at the particularly vulnerable populations that are being affected by it and how you can tie in the food security problem to find a comprehensive of solution that addresses all of these challenges together. I think that's wonderful. Um, do you have any, you know, I know you've identified the, the solutions. Do you have any plans in the future as to what you're plan where you're going to take the project? Well, like, to be honest, we were coming up with an actual, like, solution that we could show and demonstrate to everyone. But um, the organization that we point out, Green Girls, they already had that idea um, implemented word for word <laughs> for what we were planning. Which I think brought up the idea of that last point uh, because this thing already exists and we didn't know about it and it didn't, we, we literally found that out at 8 p.m. last night <laughs> because we have all of this thing that we wanted to present but like well we don't want to present something that already exists, exists so yeah. I think that's the reason that we didn't 
just back up from the presentation itself because we were thinking about doing that just because I think it's just important, important to you know do the presentation anyway yeah. Yeah. just to, yeah, to get it out there and if you found out about it at 8 p.m. that means a lot of people don't know about it you right. know it's, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's why we, right we want so it would be great yeah. to you know find ways to either work with this organization mm -hmm. or work with work in ways to you know work in outreach for example for these topics since you are like aware of all the, the problems and and how they cross connect in these different issues so I, I think you know I think the uh, that you found out this at 8 p.m. last night is a good <laughs> thing to know and a good way to kind of take this to the next step so yeah. that's uh, great and, and just real quick um, uh, you know I I, I, there's a lot of urban farming experiments that are occurring in the city. Yeah. Like it's it's actually a really exciting time for for urban and rooftop rooftop farming. Um, and there are a number of like urban farms in uh, in Bushwick, for example. Right. I, I would love to see if there's any data on uh, the efficacy of urban farms reducing the damages of the urban heat islands. Right. Because. Yep. It you know I, there there are uh, there's a lot of complexity into increasing the number of urban farms, especially yeah. in some of these areas that are that are most uh, at risk from from the heat islands, right? And I I, yeah. I almost wonder if the urban farm is the best solution yeah. at all in all cases. And I'm sure there's some data out there on that. Yeah, that's what we were trying to find. Actually, like this one of the slides time. that we took out because of time constraint was like that there is actually more data that we need as yeah. far as urban farms goes because yeah. specifically for New York City because I think because they are so they're pretty new there's not yeah. they haven't been collecting enough data so yeah. that they can possibly say that oh these are all the ecological <coughs> impacts the thing that they measure like the the one we were, that we saw in the Chicago study is mostly on um, like green spaces in yeah general, so not not, not generally really just urban, urban farm farming specifically and it's mostly not ecological impact specifically just more like, like the food social. accessibility yeah. and the social economical uh, impact yeah. So, yeah. okay very cool yeah. great, great idea thank you for presenting All right, uh, next up we have Terra Beasts, a.k.a. the Penguin Armadillos. They're going to come up and present their solution to what's for dinner. Up next on deck is Tione. So Tione, are you here? Yes? Uh, please move over to the on-deck area. Now, uh, Terra Beasts, take it away. Hi everyone, um, we are terror beasts. So what is a terror beast? So imagine Tamagotchi plus understanding what the food you eat and the carbon footprint it provides. So it's an education app as well as a gaming app as well as making it real every day. So why? So the protein choices that you make are actually very significant. So depending on whether you eat beef or chicken or soy, it really creates um, it really creates, uh, car it really impacts what your carbon footprint is. So now we're going to turn it over and do the demo. Okay, so um, we have built a um, iPhone app. Um, so anybody had Tamagotchi when they're young? Yay! All right, Laura doesn't know because she's too young. <laughs> so basically, Tamagotchi is a digital pet um, that you can um, grow. And in this case, we're going to grow it by feeding the food that you eat um, by taking a photo of it. And so this is the screen. And then everybody has their own little tarabies and it's hatching. And then hi! <laughs> Yay! So, <laughs> say hi to your terror beast. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> so, it's going to hang around and when it's about meal time, it's going to say it's hungry because it knows you're eating and it wants to eat too. So, you can feed it by taking a photo of your food. So, let's see how we can do it. We can do it by clicking the little button here. Right. And so, we're having lentil soup. And so it's going to come and eat the lentil soup with you. <laughs> and so in this case, it figures out that um, lentil soup has a 54 carbon index footprint. 
Um, so it's pretty good, actually. So let's feed the salmon this time. And let's see what the salmon is going to be. Okay. Um, hopefully it's good. Oh, it's 1,200 B. This is really high. I mean, it's really healthy, but it's really high. So it's not good. What's happening? <gasps> it grew even more. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. Right, so I'll do take you through how it evolves. So it evolves by feeding the food that you eat, you know, by sending a photo. So it go from egg to baby, and then based on how much carbon footprint your food is, it can turn into three different paths. And then furthermore, it can grow to six different paths based on if it's a meat or you know, meat or vegetarian. And so team is going to talk. Um, uh, Ava is going to talk about uh, analytics. So we'll have different analytics, and what we wanted to do is we, we saw a lot of stats around countries versus cities versus, um, and then versus your friends, so that's some of the analytics that we'll provide to users. So how, Tim? Yeah. So, so far, so good, right? It sounds fun, and how we do that? One big difference between the regular video games and therapies is that we are actually putting the data from you, yes, you, the players. So you know everyone loves selfies, right? Taking photos of your food, lunch, dinner, breakfast, whatever. <laughs> so we make use of that data and pass it to clarify and also put the data, say the score uh, of the carbon footprint from it low carbon. And we use all this information to determine which uh, monster you will get or therapies. So here is a quick demo how it do it say on the back end. So basically okay. you're gonna yep. Do you need some salmon? Oh no, it's good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so how we do is that you can choose whatever you have for dinner, lunch, and then we pass it, we are uploading to the uh, clarify server and then we put out the information okay. from there so that you will know how good or bad it is to the environment. <laughs> so we will eventually add in uh, um, some social media social so media. that we can use the hashtag instead of taking pictures so we'll put the information automatically from all sources. It's easier for you to use it in the future. Mm -hmm. so Q&A, thank you. <laughs> So you guys, in my mind, are missing like the one big major, thank you, input source, uh, MyFitnessPal. I would love to see you guys in here. So I'm an awful cook, and anything I, anything I cook is going to come out looking nothing like what it's supposed to. So I, I worry that an AI algorithm based on visual will struggle. Uh, and that's operator error, but that's fine. Um, lo I, oh, I love this dashboard, by the way. Um, and so I'd love to see you guys integrate with my fitness pal because you get a more granular input, but then you have someone else taking a lot of the pressure of the back end off of you guys and a lot of the pressure of the identification off. They've already figured that out, but it just pulls that in automatically and, and lets you guys kind of do your work on the, on the fun side of it. So um, think about that. I love the idea. I mean, it's something we talked about, which is we wanted to add recipes eventually and nutritional stats and steps, but in, for, in terms of Beta, like this is, but I love the idea, it's great. Yeah. Thank you. I just, oh, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. I, I was just going to say, I think in this, in this context, like simple is, is way better, you know, than trying to add in a bunch of, a bunch of additional features. The dashboard to me, and this is, this is getting into the weeds, but the dashboard to me seems to kind of break the experience from the Tamagotchi like experience of like raising the, raising the, you know, the, the animal. Um, anyway, something to think about as you continue to iterate on this. Yeah. Yeah, actually, uh, we have some other ideas like the leaderboard for the world. Say, for example, we can launch some challenges uh, around the world, like see which city is the, the best to do it, say, in terms of uh, having dinner, lunch, and how they do uh, to impact the, the environments. Is it New York City good or bad eating pizza? Actually, pizza is not that bad in terms of, say, <laughs> yeah, surprisingly. So we, we can do that, and it's more involving. It's, it can become a, like a, a social phenomenon, you know what I mean? So that everyone can enjoy easy. Everyone has a smartphone nowadays. It, you know, another idea would be, it would be really cool if we could kind of do a geotagged version of, of the game. For example, um, if we're thinking about the carbon footprint, you know, transportation, we never, you know, think about like unpackaging things, like how they contribute uh, to that. 
Um, so if you're eating salmon in, I don't know, um, you know, uh, Seattle versus if you're eating salmon in, uh, in the middle of the country, uh, you, the, the numbers could change. So it'd be cool to kind of integrate that as well. Um, there is a struggle between like informing and just keeping it simple as a game too, but I, I appreciate that, that you incorporated both in it. And I think the little devil guy is so cute. I'm, I'm, I would eat the worst food just to get that guy at the end. So, but he's adorable. Yeah. Well, apparently the worst food has the best carbon right, Well, I meant like the worst carbon footprint just to get the little oh, dude. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so cute. But yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you. Danger. Right. right. <laughs> so, uh, so first thing is you guys should team up with uh, Gas Genie, right? And get some augmented reality in there so people can get to uh, choose their products, right? That'd be awesome. Um, I love this. Uh, you, s you mentioned Eat Low Carbon was the, the site. Where do they get their data from? Are they with a, a affiliated with an NGO? Yeah, there's a huge organization that's uh, behind the data that mm -hmm. all they do is collect data and update the... Because uh, uh, I know that Environmental Working Group has done studies in the past, and I'm, I'm not sure how much they do with data sources or anything like that and what they provide, but I was just curious where that, that data came from. I think they're affiliated with Bon Appetit. And they look at the eight um, carb, like eight greenhouse gases, and do a like CO2 emissions, um, like equivalent emissions calculation. So we can definitely, I would love to partner with them more. That's awesome. And last thing is just a suggestion. Um, the characters are so adorable. Um, I would love to have them as like stickers that I could put on my pictures on like Instagram or whatever. <laughs> Who, who was the artist for that? Cause, oh, beautiful. So cute. Yeah. Yeah. So cute. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, next up, next up we have Tioni. They're going to be solving the what's for dinner challenge. And on deck is Waste Not. Is Waste Not here? Move on over. All right, so if you could do me a favor and just hold this for a second. Uh, do you have any sound in your presentation? No. Okay, that makes it easy for us. Let's do this. Go down here. <laughs> Not a fan of it. Almost there, right? Okay. Okay. I'll take that now. Is it a way that we want? One thing at a time. Does it look good to you? Alright, you ready? Yeah. Okay. Good luck. Wait, you just click this to go to the next part? Yeah. Okay. It's ready. Hello, my name is Tony. And my name is Tia. And, and we, we are the, the Tioni team. team. <laughs> the challenge we chose today was to choose a dish and map the life cycle of it. So we did a, so we did a before and after. The before was the non-environmentally sustainable. So we looked through the process and the problem, and then we did design thinking to create an environmentally sustainable dish. And the dish we chose was flank steak with corn and radish salad. So the process which goes into the dish, if you look over here or over there, the crops that we chose were polluted and filled with pesticides, which was radish and corn. And you see this cow down here, it's a small image, but it's, it's a steroid cow. And um, these crops are harvested and this cow is butchered and then transported to your local grocery store or supermarket and then you take home some groceries and prepare the dish. A problem we saw in this process is specifically growing crops, we saw that it was pollution, we saw it was soil erosion, and land conversion. And another problem that we saw was managing livestock. There was the animal condition, the animal diet, and the animal health is atrocious. And also the transportation to get it where it needs to be, atrocious. 
So if we look at the top images, we see the first image is a cluster of cows, the second, land conversion, and third, brutality of a cow. If you look at the last row, that spray is pesticides. This is a GMO steak, and also it's a polluted harvest. So now, environmentally sustainable, we're going to look at the dish. So imagine a world that runs on Wallabin. Wallabin is actually our app that we will talk about later. So the mission of Wallabin is to change the way corporations and consumers perceive food. So we use design thinking, like we said previously. The three, first three stages are empathize, define, ideate, prototype, and finally to actually test it. So with empathize, Tony and I researched different things and we realized that people want to eat food that tastes good, of course, but people also don't know the process of how the food gets there. And we also learned like some alerting facts, like one third of the um, of America's food goes to waste, and that's equivalent to 60 million tons, which is equivalent to $160 billion. So that's like $160 billion down the drain. So to define, we saw that the problems, the most uh, three ar overarching problems were growing the crops, um, maintaining the livestock, and actually transporting these crops and um, butchery from the meats to the grocery markets. Okay, and the third step that we did was ideate. So after we saw the problems, it's one thing to think of all the problems in the world, and it's another thing to actually solve them. So we created like a list of different ideas on how to solve the problem of growing crops. And one of the things that we thought of was like hubs. And in these hubs, um, farmers would be able to like regulate the temperature, soil um, rotation, and like all these different things so it could be easier for them to manage. Looking at um, maintaining the livestock, we would create an animator, we, we call it, to regulate the animal activity, health, diet, and tracking. Transportation would be um, an an animal individual space, temperature regulation for the crops, and monitoring for the animals. So now we're going to show a little bit of the prototype. So this is Wallabin. You have your login, you have your sign-in, then you have consumer, producer, open data. The, pr the consumer would be choose a vegetable, choose a meal, create a dish. Producer would be managed by hub, animator, transportation. And then open data would just be annual consumer waste, pesticide use, and fine local groceries. So we would know if it's effective by like having a test run, giving it to different companies so they could test it out, and that's how we would know if it would work. So we would get feedback and continue to make it better and better, and hopefully it will be changed. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's a beautiful uh, presentation and, and beautiful interface. Thank you also for walking us through the steps of how you got to your product. That was really informative. Um, I was curious, how would you think about integrating ways to incentivize people to choose kind of the more environmentally, uh, um, you know, like not as detrimental ways, for example, for, for a consumer and for a producer? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So within the app, being that um, we have participating in grocery stores, I'm um, working with Wallaby, uh, Wallabin, sorry, um, you actually get um, coupons for the grocery store that you're shopping at, and also it's really come down to your health and maintaining the environment that is around you. I, I might just think about splitting out the app into two separate apps. So one that has um, a consumer focus and the other that has the producer focus. Um, for me, when I, when I look at an app, I see the producer side in, in my messed up mind. I think, oh, how come I can't see that part of the app? Um, because it's not meant for me. So I, I think that there's a, a cool kind of next step there that's probably beyond the scope of the, uh, the, beyond the, scope of the hackathon. Um, but yeah, thank you for walking us through the process. That, that's really informative for me. And I, I feel like I have a better understanding of, of how you guys got to your conclusions. And were, were you envisioning, you said something about a, like a physical product as well, like a, like a, a space in which these foods are grown? Would, um, is that what yeah, you're talking so about? The hub, it's like, yeah. you know how they have like greenhouses? Yeah. It would be something similar to that, but it would be like, you get to regulate it. So a farmer would be able to see exactly how their crops is doing, and it will tell them when it needs to like rotate their soil so the soil stays healthy and all that type of stuff. Cool. So really our... Um, 
idea behind this hub was to knock out all the people actually doing physical work, which um, being that we are in the 21st century and we are become prevalent in use of technology, that we want to create this hub that basically essential, essentially control of the different spraying of the pesticide at a specific time, making sure that the crops are growing at a daily pace, making sure that um, the natural pesticides that are being sprayed are monitored. Yeah, you guys should look into a company called On Farm. Um, they, they do uh, farming analytics, right? It's, it's mostly for big farms, um, but there aren't a lot of solutions that are similar for smaller farms. But essentially, their business is built on introducing sensors into different you know, farming uh, environments uh, so that farmers have better understanding of how the crops are doing in a given season. Um, it sounds very similar to you guys. Maybe you can piggyback on that technology and, and bring it to smaller farms and people who are, you know, growing crops in the city and that sort of thing. Be cool. Thanks, oh, yeah. oh, just an idea while we were, we were thinking is like that dish, well, I'm hungry, but that's a different thing. Um, but the dish that you, you <laughs> the dish that you put forward, um, since you had the grocery list and you have the process input it already, you could even do something like if I want to make something, it would say buy your ingredients here or buy this here and then you could kind of direct people into buy a more, uh, you know, uh, by the best possible look, like steer them in the right direction or something like that. And that would encourage the middle people, like the grocery stores who buy from the producers and then send to the people, mm -hmm. it would encourage them to buy from more sustainable uh, locations and, and products as well. Yeah, yeah great, this is, great idea. This is a great opportunity for education. Um, you know, I mean, there's plenty of people out there, I mean, especially people who are uh, in like food deserts, like they don't even know what the difference is between organic and, and non-organic. So, um, you know, explaining the options to people and I know, again, I'm going to suggest Environmental Working Group uh, because they have things like the lists of the dirtiest or most pesticide uh, uh, vegetables and that kind of thing. So you can refer to those sorts of things and use that for data. Thank you. All right, next up we have Waste Not. Waste Not is solving the what's for dinner challenge. And on deck is H2O Go. Is H2O Go here? All right, uh, Proxima. Team Proxima. All right, you're on deck then, come on over. Right now, Waste Not, come on up. Hi everyone, uh, we're team Waste Not. Uh, I'm Sean. Tommy. Ryan. Yeah, I'm Shuyo. Okay, so we're tackling the food waste problem. We all know that we waste a lot of food. Uh, and New York City alone, every year we waste half a million tons of food. And to put that into a visual effect, that fuels 100 subway cars per day. And that's a lot of food that we're wasting. A lot of it is because uh, restaurants, they buy more food than they actually need uh, because they don't really know how much they're going to consume uh, for a lack of insights on the market. So our solution is to um, design an application that predicts the inventory needs based on real-time data. So let me show you real quick what we designed. So say I'm a restaurant owner, and this is our inventory. We have cheese, lettuce, ground beef. And this is how much I have in stock right now. And this is what it predicts uh, next week, what I'm going to use. So next week, next uh, Tuesday, it's going to rain a lot. So less people are going to come to my restaurant. That's why I'm buying 30 pounds of cheese instead of 40 pounds. And in the order history, you can see how much food I have consumed. And how do we get this data is from pulling uh, data like weather, season, neighborhood, transportation, um, and also we can customize what kind of data is impacting my restaurant consumption. Cool. So uh, you know, here are two of the graphs that you, know, you saw in the previous slide. 
Um, so I guess the real question we should really answer right now is where are we getting our data? So uh, we consider bringing into an Applebee's and stealing all their data, but that's <laughs> illegal. So we decided to uh, create a simulation over two years. Um, so this is kind of data that we, uh, this is a simulation that we ran and as you can tell, we have a restaurant that you know likes to eat salad, burgers, and pizza. And we purposely uh, made it so at spe like specific moments, like certain like foods are more popular, like we have a lot of pizza eaters and not a lot of salad eaters. I wonder why. Uh, but yeah, uh, so we took that data and we integrated it with uh, real-time data, like you know weather data, seasonal data, and uh, market trends, and we. Uh, piped it into a uh, machine learning algorithm, and this is a representation of like what our kind of algorithm came up with. This is our kind of projections for the uh, ingredients for the next like six months, uh, and this is all the uh, ingredients that are uh, that are you know, shared between all the food items. Um, so yeah, uh, another thing I wanted to sh quick show real quick was uh, well, that's not good. Oh, okay. So, cool, so this is a representation of you know, some of our data points. Uh, even though the theme is food, the real value of our product is the fact that we're pulling in from different data sets. So like, what you see there is an aggregation of three different uh, you know, data sources. The only thing that we really kind of generated was the last key, which is food. Uh, that's kind of the real value of like, uh, our you know, RESTful APIs. Uh, it's very easy to add and update new keys and you know, be able to integrate new data. So, Cool, yeah, so for all of you machine learning nerds, if you want to know the detail of our approach, uh, this is this simple linear regression thing we wrote, uh, very standard scikit-learn, <coughs> we didn't do any work. The data you saw was actually, actually predicted from the simulated data, and back to the design we have, um, on this page you can see, we're using linear actually for the node section. Uh, it's very easy to find correlations between features and our data, and we have planned to add on in like nonlinear methods like neural nets or SBMs to actually tell you how much you should purchase. And also, we want to use PCA for confidence. Thank you. So the tech that you guys are hoping to build is is pretty cool. Um, just to clarify, your target customer in this regard are the restaurants, right? Yes, restaurants, managers, and yeah, grocery stores maybe. Um, I've, I haven't worked in a restaurant in a really long time, so you know, take this with a grain of salt, but I watch a lot of Chef's Table. And uh, it, I'm just curious what you think the incentives are for the restaurants to actually start using the product. Um, and if you've thought about like, like onboarding and, and how ultimately you, you get them to use this, because a restaurant strikes me as like a really, really hectic place, and throwing in another thing that you need to keep track of, uh, it sounds like a, a, you know, it's, it's a big thing to ask. Right, so our thought is we have this uh, sort of like clarified generalized model. We take a lot of data, just find it randomly. And, but our main market would be working with the res restaurant owner about their own data. Training, uh, we, we can train them with a badge or a statistic, which is online, adaptable, which is good. And uh, the data and algorithm will adapt uh, while they, you know, go through. And uh, maybe they have happy hours or something like that. We throw that kind of data in there or pull hashtags from Twitter, like see what's the trending. Um, but yeah, they can save money by smart, uh, being smarter and managing their supply. So Yeah, if you can demonstrate that you're saving them time and money, then that's great. But if it's another thing that they have to babysit, they're not gonna do it. Right. right. So a lot of this is automated. Uh, when the customer is making an order, it will go directly into the system and tells them how much is being consumed. Uh, and then the data is also automatically uh, being integrated with their own data. Okay. Um, so, so again, uh, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to build off of the, the comments uh, just given previously, it is important to, to get user input on, on these sorts of things. Like, for example, there might be a restaurant where rain is good for the restaurant because it's an indoor mall or something, so they get more people coming in. So you're going to need to think about that aspect of training when you're putting in, when you're doing that kind of input for people. So you have to ask them how many people were in your restaurant today. Mm -hmm. So you have to have that kind of little bit of feedback as well. Um, for example, we have an update here. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. It trains the, the system like what's being consumed. So the, the, the system will know like uh, is my guess correct or not? Mm -hmm, and that's mm -hmm. why we also have a, uh, a confidence score. 
Yeah. Well, and, and, it's, and you're going to want to make sure that like the system is basically figuring out like, oh yeah, the rain mist correlating effect, right, in that. So, um, so I love that. That's great. And, and, and again, like echoing sort of like your, your return on investment is you're saving them time and money. So if you can predict how many customers I'm going to have tomorrow, I'm not going to have to buy as many supplies and that's a, that saves me money. Um, so yeah, I love this. I love this product. I think it's a great, uh, a real, a real potential volume. It's basically QuickBooks for meal preparation. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so a couple thoughts. I was uh, talking about updating your assumptions based on input. Um, I'd, I'd love to see you guys look forward, and this is my own shameless plug for Noah products. Is is look forward for weather forecasting in the future, and say so you can have a a more adaptable um, forecast going forward as the forecast changes. So um, I would just make sure there's regular updates in that. This this is totally expandable to inventory management for restaurants, which is a nightmare, by the way. That's incredibly resource intensive for restaurant managers. At least it was at the Applebee's that I worked at in South Carolina. Um, and so uh, look at adding um, more than just food. Look at adding uh, alcohol resources. Look at adding, um, y you know, the bags of, of for soda um, and, and like you said the, I love the QuickBooks analogy for restaurants because um, that that will truly make this one less thing that's think about at the end of the night when they're closing out rolling silverware doing all the side work um, this has a really really valuable real world potential um, and I'd love to see you guys keep building on that just have a quick comment you know when we go to restaurants and typically you get your uh, bills at the end of the night it actually is itemized so a lot of this information in terms of what dish is being ordered is probably already stored so if you have like a connection to a restaurant owner who is willing to trust you with their information systems it would be great to kind of do like a, a prototype with them because I mean g gosh all of this information should already be there somewhere for them so this is a fabulous way to exploit that data to something that could save m money and be you know good for the environment and yeah. all that good stuff uh, on that point you know you can probably integrate with point of sale services right and platforms um, and that saves you guys a lot of that work because you're not necessarily having to tailor it to a given restaurant you're tailoring it to a platform that many restaurants are already using exactly. well, what was it called uh, just any any point of sale service right so if, if they're using you know if they're using square or whatever right you know like you can you can tap into that yeah so Obviously, that would need to be a little. Uh, you guys would have to be able to adjust that because you know if a burger place is going to sell more burgers, and that might have less impact from weather. So, um, but yeah, ta I love tapping on the, p the POS system. Um, it's just a way of easily getting itemized yeah. results. Yeah, and there, there's a bunch of standardized ones that Aloha is a great example that restaurants use all across the country. So you could right. get some really, really great general data, mm -hmm. and then go in it to build some basic assumptions, and then go in and get some more detailed data that helps tailor to the individual restaurant. So. Um, that, that's why we have the setting session. You can check uh, which data you want to pull in. So yeah. everyone has different kind of settings. It's yeah. fully customized. Yeah. So um, obviously you can tell we're excited about this because I, I think we all see that there's a really great long-term yeah, really real-world cool. potential here. Right. A lot of different ways you can go. Yeah. And just one other thing. Um, so there's the, the Food Plus Tech uh, meetup here in the city. So there's a lot of, and for, this goes for everyone who had any kind of like food or, or food waste related product. There's a lot of investment opportunities that are available now for people to actually develop products like this. So just take a look at Food Plus Tech. Uh, just search for it online, you'll find it. Thank you. All right, you're hanging in there, you're doing great. We just have a couple more groups to present. So we're bringing up Frontierless now? No, Proxima now, Proxima. Yes, Proxima now. Proxima is solving the uh, You Are My Sunshine Challenge. That's correct? Yes. On deck is Frontierless. Is Frontierless here? Frontierless, you're on deck. So we'll see you in just a few minutes. But right now, please welcome Proxima. Hello, everybody. Are we, are we casting? So over the next few minutes, we're going to walk you through a real world. Oh. It's loading. It's loading. Oh. <laughs> well, while that's loading, let me just say, so we're going to walk you through in the next few minutes and a real world example of our, a potential real world example of what we face in a manned mission or crewed mission to Mars. So just imagine for a moment the oncoming storm. Is this? Nope. Sorry. <clears throat> The oncoming storm. <laughs> right? 
So you have, you have an information management system that's looking at your uh, energy consumption needs and your energy production needs. So how do you make your decisions? How do you move from a catastrophe that could be happening to a solution? As a commander of your, of your station, uh, again, on a remote star. So you, here, this is the high seas systems monitoring system that that's currently in use in Hawaii. And as you see, the system is pretty crude. The user interface doesn't give us a lot of interactive detail. Uh, it, it's just a splash page with some information. So what we want to do is propose a different way of organizing this information, and not only organizing information, but also providing a predictive model that allows us to make real, uh, real uh, mission critical decisions in real time, especially when that oncoming storm disconnects us from mission control, either temporarily or permanently. So we need to be able to make uh, real-time uh, data use, I mean, uh, use of our data uh, on site. So we want to create a user-friendly interface that provides uh, this information. It's clear and actionable. And we want to allow um, the system to be able to suggest and make uh, an, uh, different power consumption models based on previous, current, and forecasted conditions. So essentially the way Proxima works is that it feeds information from the current capacity of the solar panels, the battery generation uh, production, uh, and it feeds all that into our AI, which then promotes and produces scenarios if an unnormal situation occurs. And then it executes it. It gives it to the commander or the staff and it says, do this. So this is our basic dashboard. And again, this is a, an upgrade of the previous dashboard that's currently being used. Uh, at high seas. So it gives us, again, the same kind of information, but in addition to that, it gives us uh, future forecasted weather trends. It has the ability to, you know, with a, a variety of sensor packages, we can actually see what the overcast situations are. And then we also get a snapshot of the overall power consumption um, and the available power, which is just essentially a metric of generated power plus uh, produced power minus consumed power. And then we have a digital circuit breaker that is a breakout board from the previous screen that allows you to turn on and off individual experiments or uh, equipment as needed. So again, here you go. Um, you've got the consumption levels and the different scenarios that come up. Uh, the environment tab, which tells us what we are facing, so there's either satellite imagery or, or camera feeds. And then the system provides, uh, you know, based on an oncoming storm, it allows us to look at three different scenarios and gives us a way of stepping down. So it says we've selected um, option number two in the previous screen, and on, you know, and it gives us step-by-step -step instructions on how to step down our systems. So Chris is going to walk us through how this will. Oh. So in addition to um, providing tools to assist our scientists uh, in, other, um, in other planets, uh, we built a tool to help uh, people back home understand their, their power consumption needs. Um, we built this, uh, this quick VR uh, demo, and uh, the environment adjusts uh, to the simplified dashboard um, so that you know for different times of the day, <laughs> I have a quick question while they're still exploring Mars. <laughs> um, this, is, this is so beautiful and, and definitely I would, I mean, I'm not gonna say anything comparing it because a lots of good teams worked on the previous dashboard too, but this is beautiful. Um, I was just curious in comparison to that, um, did you add any, uh, you highlighted some of the features like the step down uh, for um, uh, weather conditions and, and, and things like that. Um, did you maintain all the features that were already there on the dashboard? Were there any that you eliminated? Or? Uh, so we maintained all the previous inputs with the exception of the water tanks, which we forgot to put on there. So, but yeah. Um, so we adjusted it from ours, um, but our designer's uh, computer stopped working. So I apologize for the precipitation there. But, uh. <laughs> So as a data scientist, I squirm anytime I see like a deterministic uh, forecast. So I'd, I'd just advise maybe consider using a probabilistic forecast for your dashboard where it says everything looks all right for the next 35 hours. I would just say, you know, that for the next X number of hours, you know, we're, we're pretty sure or X percent sure that everything's, yeah. yeah um, I think that kind of 
yeah, it gives you a confidence band. Um, the other thing I'd say, are you guys familiar with SCADA at all? Um, so SCADA is a power management software that's pretty commonly used in the U.S. right now. It's used in, um, the military uses it a lot, it's used in a lot, a lot of places. Um, SCADA has its limitations, um, the big one being UI. Um, it's extremely complex and it gives you a ton of really granular data, but it doesn't really tell you any insights. So I'd love to see you guys, this, I, I think there's an expansion of this into kind of that same, um, is not only giving you that like super granular and technical data, but gives someone an insight with it um, so that there's not just the technical person that could think about this. Yeah, so I guess like from our standpoint, we certainly see this as a set of different models. For instance, to forecast the future power consumption based on the previous experience, right? And also forecast the, you know, solar panels, which is the single source of energy. So we need to understand, you know, how much energy we'll have like in two hours, what's the predicted consumption and whether we, we have a balance. So this is one set of the, you know, the models we need to build and train, right? The other, like the, you know, big AI thing is that to do the decision support system and like certainly we haven't built it because like we need to gather a lot of information right now, yeah. right? But this is doable. It's certainly doable and there are some examples on the market where you can, oh, yeah. you know, have the similar cases depending on your previous experience, access rate, etc. So that's a, but like what we are showing is that a prototype mm -hmm. of, the, of the system. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, also, and just to add to that, uh, one of the, the snapshot features because we realize that there's so much information coming into the station at any given moment that our, 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 our goal was that if I walk by this panel or I pull it up, um, I can look at one me metric and right now like the green bar that's right there is just our available power which is in real time adjusted every day on current conditions. So at any given point, I the Michigan Mayor, so our, power, our power generation is down by 30%. We need to cut these things. So go to your lab and figure out what you need to cut. Yeah. Yeah, and so from a uh, command and control standpoint, that's, that's, unless you have that super technical knowledge, it can be really difficult to make those decisions. So I love, the, um, I love that you take it one step further. You're not just providing information, but you're providing recommendations rooted in, in historical data. I, lo I, I love it. I think that's a really smart way to go with this. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. No, 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 please. But I wanted to add also that, you know, this system is designed to Mars, but certainly the, some of these features can be applied to the you know, to the real Earth conditions and uh, use cases. Like the one thing, like the one type of the, you know, critical event we see is a dust storm coming. But like, if you think of it, let's say in China, they have, you know, the smoke and like, if you have your solar panels, you know, that will, inf you know, impact your, you know, the, the production rate of your solar energy. So some something like this can be applied also to, you know, to the Earth conditions. Oh yeah. I, I love that you tied it back to the earth. Um, I was just curious at, about the options that you provided for for um, conditions. What was your planning process in terms of which processes should be stepped down? Like, was it based on? I might have missed this. Like, was it based on information that High Seas provided, or or? We we looked at some of their we looked at some of their press releases and some of their information on their online, and and they outlined like mission critical can, like. Component so essentially like life support HVAC, uh, and then beyond that we assume that perhaps like when you're in you know you're running in a critical experiment that if I've got uh, biological samples that have to be maintained at temperature, uh, I can assign that as a critical function. So that is excluded from the option sets for when the system says you need to step down 30% power, and these are the systems we suggest you step down. You know. I appreciate that. That's great. Yeah. I just want to say I'm very glad that you guys created the Matt Damon rescue system. <laughs> so you don't have to worry about you don't have to worry about the dust storms clouding up the solar panels like in The Martian. So thank you for that. He um, came up. Yeah. Uh, he, we 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 play squash. Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but you know, uh, at the end of the day, like we have this. Uh, if you're on Mars, like in and NASA plans a long-term mission, they're gonna potentially have a you know resupply drops and and all these like anticipated like further exploration, right? So, but here on Earth, we don't have that resupply drop option. So for us, there is no resupply mission. So if we can port this solution from Mars or from high seas to China, to Saudi Arabia, uh, to the United States, which are the, some of the largest um, per, per, you know, per uh, square foot of, of solar power production in the, in the world right now, if we can get those solutions to them, um, we can maybe manage our systems a little bit better.
I just want to make a quick reminder to everybody too. Try to avoid handling the mic. Um, just leave it in the mic stand, sure. and uh, whoever's talking should just get up in front of it. Get real close. Just like you see how I'm doing right here. Get real close to the microphone, just like this. And you, and you don't get that. This is for the greater good. All right. All right. Yeah. Second. Okay, up now we have Frontierless, and this is a bring your own solution, bring your own solution. Up next uh, on deck is flood hydraulic power, so please get ready and assemble over by the sign, but right now please welcome Frontierless. Hi, I am Frontierless, <laughs> I'm an individual. <clears throat> okay, uh, I came here with some ideas, uh, I didn't have anything that I was specifically going to do. Um, I started out with a uh, Unity application that has space and planets and that type of thing. And uh, one of the young ladies that gave a talk, her name is Sarah Pearson, and it was on uh, planets that may have life on it. And I kind of had like a wow kind of moment. Suppose we could take the data that was being fed and put it into uh, virtual reality models, right? And then I just remember the problem that I had when I was developing it. You didn't see this a second ago, but now you see Earth and you see me having to name all these things and set up these strings. So suppose we had something um, that could do that automatically for us. And since we have about five billion years of doing this <laughs> until our sun uh, goes uh, major nova, right? Uh, we're we're, we're, we're going to be able to run through these models yearly, if not monthly, right? So if you could split this between the virtual reality of all these different uh, areas where you think life might be, and you train uh, a, a, a tool like uh, Clarify, to specifically look for uh, points, you could take that uh, with, with a scientist, uh, and as he's going through it and snapping different shots, he could be actually sending that out to a website where children in schools and everybody, anybody around the world could actually see what the scientist is looking at and how the things are being labeled. So that's what I came up with. Um, uh, so I decided to see if the virtual reality image would work with Clarify, and it does. Uh, how to get to my GitHub page is through the space apps. Um, I put it right there, and uh, it basically opens up, and I have instructions uh, for people, how to, how to use it and how to set it up. Um, so I want to give credit to Clarify. They have an API that I was able to use within seconds. The um, encoding was required because I'm not going to be able to send it to a, a website when I'm in a virtual environment, right? So I'm going to have to encode that. Their API works that way, right out of the box. And I just, for the sake of people who might want to take a look at this, I, I, I gave you a link to the NPM package, um, the Angular Universal 4 seed that I'm using, uh, and, and uh, Unity. So I have here uh, some text. This project helps solve a very big problem. The people of Earth in five billion years will have to live on other planets. Uh, we need tools to help us. Um, Creativity, it pulls together data models from space, models in virtual reality, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, augment understanding allows people from all over the world uh, to share the knowledge. Uh, the project gives access to knowledge to people uh, from all over the world. Uh, sustainability, the project is looking for members. I did this thing by myself. <laughs> Little humor. Uh, <laughs> and this is Clarify, this is the 
uh, app. So these are the actual pictures that I took from the virtual reality with the planets. And if my website is working, uh, you'll see the text uh, come up. Uh, I don't know why it's not working, but uh, that's what I have. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, my network went down. Yeah, it's the cool. most terrifying thing in the world is a live tech demo. Oh, it's back up. Um, so I, I guess my quick question is, is the, the goal to, I, to use the VR and the, uh, the AI to discover planets that could potentially support human life? Yes. Uh, I think if you take a look at some of the work that people are doing within cities, uh, they have images that don't look like a city at all, right? So eventually, you're going to be able to get that same type of imagery to coming in. Uh, there's technology that you guys haven't invented yet that's going to be able to capture things and interpret and understand that information uh, and actually create the models for you, right? So you're going to have a VR type solution where you just go out and pull these different things in. So I put in, in here uh, Trappist. Maybe you might want to look at the Trappist model, you know, right now. So you just call for Trappist. All these uh, uh, technologies, uh, there's a synergy, right, between virtual reality, web services, the web, you know, everything is coming together. It's just, you know, I've been doing this a long time and I still get amazed, so. Yeah. Thanks very much. Thanks. You're welcome. All right, up next we have flood hydraulic power. Flood hydraulic power is solving the water, water everywhere challenge. Uh, and on deck we have Issy. Issy with Bring Your Own Solution. So Issy, uh, get ready on deck. And right now, please welcome flood hydraulic power. Hello, everybody. Today we are going to talk about the hydraulic powers. When we talk about the flood, the disaster, water everywhere, we know that we have seen the blackout for three and a half days in 2012. If this is a case with this country, which is more advanced, so how about the other countries of the globe? For that, the small solution what we have come up with is fixing the turbines in the riverbeds. And for that, we will be using the St. Vernant equations. What does the St. Vernant equation talks about? It talks about the bed slopes, the river flow, with which we get the kinetic energy, and then the slopes, which we talk about, reducing the speed, and the amount of water, and the weight, everything we are going to calculate it. It's a small device which we have to fix it at the lower level of the riverbed. With this, we will be able to produce 12 kilowatts of electricity per day with one unit. For example, with us, with, for each home, we require close to about 30 kilowatts with all our luxuries. The electricity, the heaters, the fridge, the fan, blah, 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 with the lights and everything. When it comes to the disasters, when it comes to the needs, there is no luxury. There is a need which, is, which has to be met. For that, we require minimum between 8 kilowatts to 12 kilowatts, with which we can sustain with, uh, with a fan, the electricity that is with the bulbs, the refrigerator, and the medical equipments, where we have a backup for. So, what we have plans is, we have the places and the, uh, and the points with the maps where we are going to see that where we have to plant these turbines and how we can generate the electricity so that nobody goes blackout. Not only in this country, across the globe. And moreover, the investment for this turbine is only $5,000 if it comes to the manufacturing end. It's a one-time investment and it's a low maintenance. 
So we request the government to go ahead and do that, and now my colleague will take over. Thank you. Uh, so you know what my, what my our project is about. So the important part now is the two parts. So where we are having the floods and where how the terrain of that area is. So we are gathering the data sets from two government websites. One is from the Missouri, right now we are targeting that area because that's facing right now the floods and everything. And we are uh, getting t uh, terrain data. So if you see, right, so these, out of these, the black dots, they, there, if you see the red dots, here where we can place the turbines. So by placing the turbines over there, we will get maximum throughput from the electricity. So and as these turbines are portable, we can uh, automatically remove that depth from them and we can place it to somewhere else, which will be proving useful for governments to transport the turbines from here and there, which is cost efficient thing. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Hey, so I'd love to see you guys check out uh, the National Weather Service just operationalized as of August of last year, the national water model. Um, it takes data from 2.2 million points as opposed to the previous estimates of like 4,000 points. Um, and it does a really, really great job of uh, predictively telling you where water is gonna be when and how much. Um, awesome tool for flood prediction. Um, I could go on and on about that product, but I think this is a really cool application for you because it could give you a really great estimate of how much volume of water is coming downstream. Right. And it might even help you provide a, a little bit of a, a predictive estimate of the amount of power you could generate. That's correct. We take up the real time estimations and then we see, and with the weather management and the weather companies, where they give us the details before 48 to 72 hours. So we know how to take it forward. Yeah, so uh, check out the National Water Model. There's a 48 hour rolling store of live data, of real time data is available online right now. Yes. Um, if I am successful in what I hope to do, then there will be a lot more of that. But yes. um, yeah, I, I think it's a cool application for you guys. Uh, but I, I love the low cost of hardware. Yes. $5,000 for you. power generation is awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, go ahead. Um, I just, uh, yeah, I'm really intrigued about the, the turbine design that you talked about. Um, and, you know, is, do you have like a, 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 design, a sketch or, or any kind of oh, prototype yes, in mind do. for yes, what it would be do. like? We yeah, do. that'd be great to see. Yes, it's a small portable device. Okay. Does so it exist already? No, it, does, it, oh, does. Okay. it does, it does, it does. It does exist, but it requires a lot of, lot of work to take it forward. Okay. Because now what they're saying is that, uh, you know, how is that, which are the points we are gonna get it, and then what is the cost which we have to invest on it, and nobody has worked out with the government projects yet. It's an upcoming project. Okay, so, so it exists already, and, and your product will basically help identify various locations based on flood exactly. and where to put it. Right. Exactly. Got it. That's, That's right. great. That's right. Um, since it does, it does exist, it, you said it's not been deployed yet, so it's exactly. not currently in use? The okay. Canadian government, they have invented this project, but I don't know for what reason they don't want to take it further, but definitely if we make a couple of changes, like what we want to do it with the applications, I'm sure that with these kind of applications, if, you are going to, if they could produce 12, 12 volts, but we are targeting up to 28 volts for that mm -hmm. with a new application process. Okay. So, okay. That's so you're, you're providing a means for understanding like how to deploy it. And yeah. That's and correct. Making it so they can, they can fast that, track it to use To the point where we can deploy it so that it's simple for a common person or the government people to understand. Okay, very cool, great. Thank you. That's awesome because it, it you know, requires very, like you don't have to build something else, it's already existing. That's correct. And um, you're basically finding information that will help make it more efficient and, and more productive. So that's great. Yeah, did you get that bomb from, uh, from like a government website or? Which the, the cost of the unit, the, the, no, no, the bomb? No, no, bought it from the company. You did? It's okay. The company cost us, the retail price is 12500 If we make it with our inverters, that's going to cost us $4,997.60. So, you know, we should be able to make it. But the inverters, what we are going to make it, that's going to be different than them. Yeah. Because they will be able to make only 12 volts 12 kilowatt per day. But with our inverters, with the energies and the equations, what we are going to use it, we should be able to get close to about 28 kilowatt per day. 
So, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, up now is the final project of the afternoon. Uh, I would like T. Missy to come on up. I believe they are solving the Bring Your Own Challenge. There you go. Okay. You will so take I need the HDMI. Okay, you take that. And you take that. Right. Okay. Hi, my name is Laura. I'm from, I'm the founder of ISSI. Um, ISSI stands for International Space Station Interesting Exercise. Um, and in microgravity, you need two hours of exercise every day to stay safe from bone and muscle loss. Our mission is to make exercise more fun on the ISS and here on Earth too. Last year at the hackathon, we were here. Um, we made augmented reality games to make exercise time fun time. We used the Google Cardboard, Unity, Vuforia, Raspberry Pi, and Makey Makey, but what we really wanted was a HoloLens. <laughs> this year, we have a HoloLens and a space-themed game. ISS has a HoloLens too. And we also have a team in New York and Seattle. Our New York team is James. Um, James Doyle. Me, Laura Doyle. Howard Robinson. Yelpin. Peja. And Hyung Seo. Our Seattle team is. Our new game is called Earth Magic. Since this year's theme is Earth, and we were thinking about how last year's game we did space, so we also added in, we thought about the astronauts. So, we added in what they missed most, nature. Birds, water, trees, stuff like that. So this year we made a game based around a single mission. Restore Earth after an environmental devastation. But, we have to make it healthy, don't we? So, in order to grow trees and restore rivers and bring back the birds, you have to exercise. The exercises are ones astronauts will always do as part of their routines, like deadlifts, squats, and heel raises. Now, for the demo video, if I can get this right.
So, uh, anyway. and Seattle team. Yeah. Next slide, please. Oh, yeah. So, um, we were here last year. We made a great game. We've, uh, we made a game in the meantime, and this weekend we built the game another amazing game. So, we plan to have more fun with Earth Magic um, and envision this as something that will ultimately be multiplayer, where astronauts and people on Earth can collaborate on building. Uh, cities and wilderness areas uh, together, and maybe even get competitive with that. Um, Earth Magic is just one of the games that we're imagining for this year. We imagine more games and more exercises. Um, we're looking forward to demoing to astronauts this year and getting their feedback. And uh, the work that we're doing for up there is applicable down here, like the whole thing about Earth that we have this year. Uh, um, so, other applications for fighting obesity, for um, helping people with physical therapy who also have to do a lot of repetitive exercise and can use fun in their day as well. Um, and someday, any questions? So, how do I get one of those t-shirts? <laughs> uh, this seems really fun. I, I like the idea of it being being multiplayer and everybody's kind of working together to build something. It's like it's like it's like AR Minecraft, you know, but with exercise, which is way better. Um, I, and that's I think that's really really that's really cool. Um, and and I I I thought you were saying that you wanted to. You wanted to map the exercises to what the astronauts are already doing as part of their routine, right? Like, I like the idea of incorporating things like, you know, uh, deadlifts, for example, into into you know what the process of, of like hoisting logs would be, right? So it's like it's almost like yeah. I'm back home, I'm doing physical exercise, but I mean, like in nature, you're more in touch with the earth. Um, I think that's that's really really cool. If you guys can can pair those up really well. Exactly. Um, so yeah, and I, I, of course I love this too, and it made me immediately think of a project that was also developed here at Space Up since NYC a number of years ago called Sentiate. Uh, Leslie Birch, who uh, was here at the conference on Friday, uh, made an olfactory wearable which gave you the smell uh, perception. So you guys would have audio, visual, and smell if you're like in the dirt or you're doing something, you're digging something, or you smell water. Um, it's a I think an amazing additional dimension to this. Um, on top of that, I think it'd be great to you know, you can do mixed reality with these things as well, right? In terms of, at least you can have some 360 video, right, which would be really immersive, and then have like virtual objects within the 360 video that's actually like building and stuff. I, like, that would be another great, like, I mean, gosh, on the space station, that would be like utter magic, right? Seeing real trees and then growing a virtual tree and then smelling the dirt. Um, that would be amazing. Yeah, I love the the progress that you've made from last year. It was so great to to meet the team last year and and, and see everything that you've developed with the Hololens. Um, just one thing that occurred to me is when you're doing the exercises and I know it like logs how you're doing. It'd be great if you could also see if you're doing it right. You don't want people to hurt themselves. So if you know somebody does it lo wrong, you're like, yeah. So yeah, we had to pull a muscle on the space station or something. <laughs> so yeah, but great job. This is. It was really fun, and I like how you tied in the Earth and helping restore the Earth virtually. It was a lot of fun, so great, great job. Yeah, you, you took one of the thoughts right out of my head. It was uh, form. So, uh, you know, does the tree grow faster or taller because you're doing your squats properly as opposed to slumping your chest over or, or whatever? So I think that's a really cool idea. Um, one thing to explore, and this probably really <laughs> expands uh, the range of VR, but I'd love to see, like, multiple environments. Uh, you know, for me personally, growing up in a, a more rural environment, the city, uh, the, uh, the, the trees and the river and the birds, that's awesome. Uh, but it'd be cool to kind of capture that for people that uh, are more urban oriented. Um, so, you know, helping rebuild buildings in a true sim city fashion, as long as no one has put power lines down, um, you know, rebuilding a city or, or rebuilding a few different environments. I think you could do a handful of things, uh, a beach scene, a, a forest, an urban environment that I think would really help people connect even more closely with some of those things they miss so uh, but this is 
Awesome. I love this. Uh, I think this has applications in uh, physical therapy, which you touched on. Um, yeah, obviously the International Space Station. Um, I think there's a whole range of applications for this. Um, just getting me off the couch and going to the gym, I think, was, was a cool way, too. So uh, I love it. I think you guys are, are on a great track here. Well, I mean, better. I don't have to go right, to the right, gym, right. You know, which yeah, is nice because the gym sucks. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, that's, that's a good point, because I, I make enough excuses that are involved with the distance between my apartment and my gym, which is literally a half mile. Um, so if you could get me off my couch, give me an excuse to buy uh, VR, and um, give me exercising. I think those are a lot of really great concepts. You guys are on a really cool path, and I'm, I'm really excited to kind of follow this and see where it goes. about the microphone. So that was the last project of the day. Let's give a round of applause to all of the wonderful teams, the wonderful hackers that put such uh, great projects together. Great projects. Okay. And now before we take a break for judging, uh, Ann Rosenberg from our organizing partner and event host, venue host, SAP, uh, would like to come up and say a few words. Uh, Ann? <laughs> So how has it been? Has it been good? Yeah. Has it been hard? Has it been difficult? <laughs> not for you, not in the opening. Um, we have been very delighted to be able to host this. Um, and as I said, you are actually the first one to be in this space here after we open it uh, Thursday. So I actually want to ask you all, how have it been? And don't be nice, just be sad as it is. How would it have been to be in the space? Does the space work for something like this? Yes. Woo! That's good. <laughs> it's, um, so my team around the world, we do around 1,000 to 1,600 hackathon in EU, James. Uh, and, um, and we've done that for a couple of years. And I, as I said in my opening, um, we started being part of the, um, the, whole, co the whole corporation in Silicon Valley last year. Uh, we also are part of it in Silicon Valley this year and then here in New York uh, and in Bangalore. And um, I'm really proud to see how it worked out. Um, it was also great for me to observe how uh, this space, because it's a newly open space, how you could sit privately and work, but also how you can get together up on the stage here. Uh, because that's what it's all about when you are um, building the next big ideas that you guys have been doing. Now, of course, we need to see, uh, because you're not the only one in the world who have been working on the challenges, uh, and a couple of hundreds. I know my team all in India, um, there are 300 people, 100 teams, uh, but I know you're up against um, incredible people all over the world. Uh, but let's see, normally New York do extremely well, I have heard, um, right? <laughs> Is that right? Right, yeah? Um, so, um, but again, uh, thank you for letting uh, SAP uh, host this incredible event. Uh, it's a big inspiration. It's a, it's a big thing for us also because SAP now have opened up an innovation space here in New York City. And uh, I remember last year <coughs> with my team, uh, we were even trying to get one person into the event last year. We couldn't get in. So we kind of had it as, uh, right, <laughs> Josephine, <laughs> you couldn't get in. So we were kind of like, Somehow we need to get involved with this in New York, and here we are, we're actually hosting it. So we are very thankful and very delighted for that, and I'm happy that this, this space worked out. And uh, let's see if uh, you guys uh, are able to be some of the best teams in the world. I also want to say thank you to you. Yes, he is uh, my partner in crime um, uh, on, on uh, supporting us uh, in uh, working. You should come up here. Yeah. <laughs> Woo! Um, and say a couple of words. Uh, you are my partner in crime uh, at the location that SAP are, are supporting. Uh, so what do you think about uh, the event and what you just heard here? It's, w it's wonderful seeing everyone come together 
um, you know, what we say is like no expectations, right? You never know with the creativity and inno innovation that you all have within your souls, your heart. It was just so obvious watching all the presentations, just how passionate you are about your local community in the world, the earth, the, the galaxy, the universe. So I feel like we should all continue to work together to t even, even if, you know, you're not we're not placed globally. We should continue fostering your ideas and pushing them forward. That's what we do here at SAP, at NASA, NOAA. Let, let's let's take your your ideas to the next level together. We can figure it out, right? So. Um, we are we are actually uh, Josephine. You should come up and talk about this. Uh, actually, my whole team should come up here. Sandra and Josephine. Uh, uh, Conrad, he's probably behind the screen downstairs, Conrad. Uh, um, but we're actually hosting um, Christiana, so come up here. Let's see if we get them up. Uh, there you are, Conrad, that's good. Um, we're actually hosting a meetup, um, uh, and you should say a couple of words about this because we would actually like um, people to come and pitch what they've been building. Uh, so if we could say a couple of words because I know all of you were lucky to hear about all the great ideas and of course the people who are following the live streams. But we want to do a meetup uh, where people in general can come and hear about all the great ideas. Will you say when the meetup is and see if you can inspire the people to come and talk? <laughs> um, yeah, so we're doing a meetup to kind of like wrap up what's been happening here throughout the weekend and on Friday. Um, so we want all the winners to have a chance to come and really show what they've built and what they've been hacking. Um, so we're doing this on Tuesday and it's going to be at night so hopefully you guys won't be super busy so you can come. I know there's a lot of people who've been traveling here from actually like all over the world um, but the people that are in New York could come. It'll be from like s I think 6 till 9 or so. Um, so yeah we just want you guys to come and show what you've been been doing and present your, your great solutions. I also want to say, if any of you want to continue, you probably want to continue working on your great um, prototypes and ideas. You're very welcome to use this as a workspace to meet and come and continue working on, on your projects, if you like to do that. I mean, normally the coffee bar is open. The coffee, is, it's uh, Brooklyn Roastery, is very nice. And I think the view talk, if, I don't, I don't think I need to convince you on your view, uh, but if you'd like to come continue working on your projects, uh, you can definitely come and work out of here. Um, and uh, yeah, I think maybe uh, Conrad, Sandra, Christiane, should say a couple of words? Wow. Thank you so much, everybody, for sharing your amazing projects today. It was so overwhelming. We were so inspired. I was sitting next to Julia, and we were just like, oh my god, this idea is so good. Oh, and the next one. Oh, this is so good. This tops the other one. No, it doesn't. OK, yeah. <laughs> so we've just been so overwhelmed. It's been amazing. So thank you so much for sharing You know your passion and, and, and your projects that you've been working so hard on. It's so admirable. and. Uh, as Julia said, I want to speak to what Julia said. We want to help you take it to the next level. Uh, SAP is a big enterprise software company, so for those who doesn't know what SAP is, and it's like, what am I doing here? It's SAP, I have no idea what they do. <laughs> That's not uncommon, especially not for this generation, which is primarily represented right now. Uh, so SAP is one of the world's largest enterprise software companies, and we have 345,000 customers, and we would love to help you make our customers some of your customers. So with that said, Christiane? <laughs> OK, thank you. I wouldn't need a second invite to come here to work because it's really amazing. And I can tell you that all the spaces look like this. So grab the chance, come here, and do more of this really, really cool work. And tell about it, spread the word. Um, I think there's so much to do for our planet, no matter where you look. Challenges, challenges, and so much to be done. So looking forward to your amazing solutions. So guys, also from me, um, this is our first external event. And I'm really happy how good it turned out. And it was just possible for all these good participants who make this event possible. So a big thank you to you. And also a big thank you to the Space Challenge Lab team. 
which really supported and which make this a crazy event and really good event happening. And so a big thank you from our side to the team to make this happen. Thank you. Thank you for, for saying that because um, as I said in my opening notes, uh, they literally believed in us uh, because they saw this space with us just absolutely nothing in this space. And we talked about, so where could the stage be? Should we build a stage? No, no, no stage. So um, thank you for trust, have the trust in us. And I know it was not super easy. We have a lot of restrictions. Uh, um, but I think, let me ask you, is, has it been okay? Amazing. It's been amazing, okay. So we would love, if you like to do it again next year, you'll, we would will, will love to do it again. Uh, now we know how it works, <laughs> uh, right? <laughs> it's not just a vision and idea. Um, so we would love to do it again, if you like to do it again here for sure. So thank you so much and um, yeah. enjoy. And we hope to see you come here and build. This is also your space. Uh -huh. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to SAP. This is a beautiful space and I'm glad that we were able to share it this weekend. Uh, so uh, here's the, here are the next steps, all right? Uh, we're going to let our judges go off and they're going to deliberate and they're going to select the, the, the winning projects that uh, I described earlier for the challenges, the categories that we talked about. Uh, in the meantime, while they're doing that, it's time for all of you in this community to pick your people's choice. The way we're going to do it is you're going to line up over where we picked up t-shirts and you're going to tell camera, the volunteer in the green shirt in the back, which project do you think uh, is the best project or which project is your favorite. We're going to reconvene. Yes, you want to say something? Yeah, sorry. Before people leave, can you please come back so I can take a picture of all of you where you're like super energetic and crazy and... Okay, we're going to come back for awards in uh, about 20 minutes or so. Okay? Yeah. All right. We're going, to, we're going to take the picture during awards. So please go line up, uh, do your People's Choice Award, and maybe in about... Uh, how much do you? All right, so in about 20 minutes, uh, which is uh, just after 5.30, uh, come back and we will start doing the presentations.